I think it's a very, very tight rope that the Fed is walking. What we expect him to do is to lay the ground for why a March rate cut makes sense. I still don't think they're actually going to be cutting in March. They're not really in a rush. March just seems a little premature. I think 50-50 is a good probability. Do they go in March? Probably not, but they likely ease at some point in the second quarter to try to get ahead of any weakness. I think the Fed's in a really tricky spot. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. Live from New York City this morning, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Lisa Abramowitz together with Anne-Marie Hordern. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P 500 negative by 0.5%. It is Fed decision day. Remember the middle of December when Chairman Powell said we're kind of talking about rate cuts and then Williams came out and said we're kind of not. Which one is it today? Well, honestly, I think everyone's gotten carried away with, okay, rate cuts and probably this particular press conference is going to remove the hiking bias. We're going to be parsing through the granularities of this statement this afternoon at uh, 2 p.m. and then the press conference at 2.30. Unlikely they're going to make a move, but they're probably going to lay the groundwork to have flexibility to make that move, uh, maybe in March, maybe in May, maybe after that. A two-part story this morning. We need to talk about the tech earnings as well. High expectations. Let's put it that way. Before we start talking about disappointment, let's go over what we looked like over the last 12 months. Alphabet was up 60% over the last 12 months. Lisa, Microsoft was up 65%. I think you have to bear that in mind before you look at the pre-market price action and consider the numbers of yesterday. I could not agree more. The bar was clearly incredibly high. We were asking yesterday, is the bar very high? The answer is absolutely. People want more. Honestly, these earnings were not bad at all. When you take a look at some of the underlyings, Microsoft's net income rose uh, to the strongest quarterly expansion going back two years. Google talking about a real expansion in their advertising revenues. But it wasn't enough. And it came in slightly disappointing on the Google side. So forget it. AMD, same story in terms of the projections with some of their uh, AI outlook and the chips related to that. This is about high expectations or maybe unrealistic expectations not being fully met right away. You mentioned Microsoft. Go through it line by line again. Strongest revenue growth since 2022. Cloud services sales gaining 30 percent. That's some pretty decent growth. And this is on the hopes and dreams of artificial intelligence coming to the cloud. Here's the key question. How quickly do investors need to see that AI monetized? Because right now, it's clear that that's driving a lot of demand. But the expectations for how much money that would actually drive to these companies clearly outstripped reality. That is the question right now. Microsoft a little bit lower by about 1%. Alphabet a whole lot lower than that. Need to talk about the politics as well. AMH, a new poll from Bloomberg and Morning Consult. Not for pretty reading for the president of the United States. No, absolutely not. In this latest iteration of our poll, we do see Trump continuing to gain ground on the most critical states, these seven battleground states. And what I find very fascinating is the fact that still the economy remains the top issue, but the gap is starting to narrow in terms of those voters that actually say immigration is a top issue. And if you look at those age 25 and older, the economy and immigration, Jonathan, are neck and neck. Greg Vallier of AGF coming up on the program a little bit later this morning. Look out for that. Let's lay the table for you. This is what it looks like going into the Federal Reserve. Equity futures on the S&P 500 pulling back by zero. 0.5%, a muted couple of days in the equity market. In the bond market, yields unchanged 4.026% on a 10-year. In the FX market, the euro negative 0.2%. 108.26, Bramo, I'm not sure what's more important, Lagarde on inflation or Lagarde on politics. Lagarde seems to be more interested in politics right now based on what we've heard over the last few weeks. She got a lot of criticism about her comments on Trump. And her response, doubling down. And that seems to be what we've heard pretty much uh, time and time again when she goes on different news channels and different press conferences. So again, question is, what's she trying to accomplish in her role as the head of the uh, European Central Bank when she's talking about U.S. politics? Kind of inappropriate, but let's frame it as follows. You've got central bankers in Europe talking about politics in the U.S. and politicians in the U.S. talking about central banking in Washington. You notice <laughs> that as well? Yes. It's kind of role reversal right now. Every single Democrat seems to have something to say to Chairman Powell. And the latest was Sherrod Brown last night. They're all saying that you need to cut rates. But a lot of this, and you know, our analysts told us this as well, this is political grandstanding. They're saying it now because the Fed is going to have a decision today. But also, they've been saying it for months that they want the Fed to cut rates. The issue is, this could put Powell in a tricky place when he goes and visits Congress. When he goes and sits down with Republicans, are they like, are you cutting rates because the Democrats asked you to and we're ahead to an election? 
it's it, it's it's tricky for him this year, given it is an election year. Do you think, though, that anyone really thinks that the Fed is going to say, oh, Sherrod Brown asked me to cut rates. I think I'm going to. I think that the bigger question to me <laughs> is, what is the messaging from some of these Democrats that are saying this in terms of the reasons for inflation? What Sherrod Brown said is, it is becoming increasingly evident that restrictive monetary policy is no longer the right tool for combating inflation. Are they basically going to try to shunt the blame to the Federal Reserve for the lack of sentiment that seems to be not reflecting some of the rosier economic data coming out? It is political grandstanding. It was inappropriate when the Trump administration did it. It's inappropriate now. What's stupid about now and really, really stupid about now, and we should use that word, they're about to cut interest rates anyway. Yeah. What are you doing? What are you doing? Just hold tight. This is about how they're trying to craft the message around inflation when it's been pretty muddy. And that's not necessarily so clear. Coming up this hour, Peter Oppenheimer at Goldman Sachs following disappointing results from Mega Cap Tech, Greg Vanier of AGF Investments, and the latest Bloomberg poll shows Donald Trump expanding his key leads in swing states, and Bruce Kasman of JP Morgan ahead of today's Fed decision and US payrolls on Friday. We begin with our top story. Mega Cap Tech disappoints. Peter Oppenheimer of Goldman Sachs expecting the scale of the rally from here to be tempered, writing, quote, while there are upside risks to profit growth, it is still likely to remain moderate as lower inflation dampens nominal GDP and revenues. Peter Oppenheimer, chief global equity strategist at Goldman Sachs and author of his new book, Any Happy Returns, Structural Changes and Super Cycles in Markets. Peter, great to catch up with you, sir. Congratulations on the book. And what a fantastic title. We can talk about that in just a moment. Let's talk about the tech earnings go. overnight. Was that disappointing, Peter? How would you frame those numbers overnight? Well, I think, as Lisa said, exactly, this is, these are good numbers, but the expectations were huge. And there's a real issue of traveling and arriving. You know, the markets have been rallying strongly, not just in mega cap tech, but broadly speaking, you know, over the last two or three months. Since October, equities up, you know, almost 20%, one of the strongest rises we've seen for a very long time, as very, very positive expectations are priced in about soft landing, and the speed and extent of interest rate declines as inflation moderates. So these are not bad numbers. These companies are generating fantastic revenue growth and are in a very strong position. But I think you know the upside um, from a market perspective in the short term was likely to be limited given the expectations that have been priced in. And I like how you phrase this, that even though equities have entered the optimism phase of the cycle, you think a lot of that good news has been already priced in. How vulnerable, then, is this market to some sort of significant downdraft in the face of something actually negative, not just something that yep. failed to meet expectations? Yeah, the, there are risks. And it's interesting that valuations, particularly in the U.S. equity market, are in the sort of 90th or 95th percentile relative to history. And implied volatility in the equity market is very low. So there isn't a lot of risk priced in. Equity risk premium, so looking at equities compared, compared to bonds, are also pretty low. So I think there is room for disappointment. It wouldn't be surprising if we get a bit of a pullback, given the scale of the rises that we've seen. I think the biggest risk from here is not really on the speed of the falls in interest rates. As John said, rates are going to come down anyway. The question is just simply when they start. The bigger risk is if you start to see any disappointment in terms of growth, because as you mentioned earlier, profit growth in aggregate is not really all that strong. As inflation comes down, revenues are likely to slow. So any weakness in the economy would probably be the biggest downside risk for equities at this stage. And we do see some earnings declines actually across the board with profit margins really being squeezed, at least when you aggregate some of the earnings so far. I'm wondering, based on this idea that a lot of the good news has been priced in, do you get the sense that the US is more overpriced relative to Europe, that maybe there hasn't been as much good news baked into Europe, and on a risk-reward kind of level, there are more opportunities? Yeah, look, we could have said this uh, for any time over the last decade. The US equity market has been more expensive than others, but that's been justified, actually, by much stronger profit growth in the US than in Europe or other parts of the world, really, for a decade or more since the financial crisis. Having said that, I think it's important to emphasize that the differences are narrowing from a fundamental profit growth perspective. You know, last year, S&P profits were flat. Uh, that was about the same as Europe and other parts of the world. This year, we're expecting about 5% profit growth in the US, relatively similar to what we're expecting in Europe and Japan, for example. But the valuation gaps remain. 
Um, you know, if you look at uh, Europe, it trades pretty much at around 12 and a half, 13 times PE, the US closer to 20 times. Um, and US uh, companies are more expensive in every, virtually every sector compared to their European counterparts. So I think the real secret here is to look at a bit more diversification geographically. Um, that isn't to say one should be negative on the US, but look for some opportunities outside of the US. And there's a selection of areas in Europe, Japan, and even in parts of Asia, which I think can uh, offer those attractive diversification opportunities. Peter, let's talk about that. What am I buying when I buy Europe? When I buy the US, I'm buying Microsoft, NVIDIA. Europe right now seems to be ASML and Novo right. Nordisk. Peter, what am I buying when I buy Europe? A great question, John. And actually, I think what's very well understood is the US market is very highly concentrated. You know, big seven stocks, tech stocks that we were talking about earlier account for about 30% of the index. What's less well understood is that you've got huge concentration in the European equity market as well. What we've termed the granolas, which happens to be a name made up of the starting letters of the 10 or 11 biggest companies in Europe that cut across technology, luxury, consumer staples and healthcare. These companies account for about 25% of the index. And when I say the index here, I'm talking about the stocks 600. So think about that. 10 or 11 companies are a quarter of the value now of the 600 biggest companies in Europe. They're the ones that are really driving the index. They're very global. They have strong uh, cash flow generation, high profit margins. They're reinvesting at a high rate. They're good compounders. And these should be, I think, among the global uh, growth leaders that investors should be thinking about among other great US and other companies. Peter, now for the appearance fee, the book plug. Let's do it. <laughs> Any happy returns, structural changes and super cycles in markets. Peter, what do we need to know? Well, my last book, which I wrote three years ago, Any Happy Returns, was all about cycles. What drives cycles and turning points in markets? This is really about long-term structural trends within which those cycles evolve. And we've had a very, very positive secular trend in the last 30 years, driven by disinflation, globalization, liberalization of financial markets, lower global risk premium, and so on. We are moving into a more challenging period where the cost of capital is higher. We're getting more regionalization, less globalization, higher input costs, labor and energy. That means lower margins, so lower returns. But it's also very much focused, this book, on the two major developments which are going to shape the next decade, despite those headwinds. And that is the combined effect of AI on the one hand and decarbonization on the other. And while both of these face significant challenges, uh, they're going to provide significant opportunities for investors as well. Looking forward to a copy arriving on my desk sometime soon. Peter, thank you. <laughs> Peter, it's good to hear thank from you. you. So it's good to see us. Thank you. Peter Oppenheimer there of Goldman Sachs. Bramo wants to weigh in. What are we buying when we buy Europe? <laughs> well, I think fashion and skinniness. If you look at LVMH, it was just surpassed by Novo Nordisk as the biggest one. I mean, it just where you put those two together. Can I just say one other thing? Sure. In the U.S., we have the Fang. In Europe, move over, Fang. We've got the granolas. You know, yeah. it's sort of, you know, that's the new acronym. It's, it's a Goldman acronym. Uh, it's, it doesn't sound exciting enough, does it? It's not as it? catchy. Like, you know? Fang. Fan mag. Granola. Granola. Just sounds vanilla and slightly boring, yeah. right? Or just breakfasts, you know, that you basically get if you don't want to cook. Precisely. That with some yogurt, which makes you feel like you're being slightly creative, <laughs> Ramo, which is what a lot yeah, of people yeah. do at home, 100%. I know. Not that there's anything wrong with that, of course. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Yahara Hackers. Hey, Yahara. Hi, John. Elon Musk's $55 billion pay package at Tesla has been voided by a Delaware judge after a shareholder challenged it as excessive. The ruling takes a giant bite out of Musk's wealth and could put the fate of his companies in question. It's, it's Musk's first major loss in court and means Tesla's board will have to come up with an alternative to the co-founder's compensation. The ruling is expected to be appealed. Comcast's UK-based media arm Sky is said to be planning to cut about 1,000 jobs across its business. The Financial Times reported the restructure has been spurred by more customers switching from satellite delivery to digital-only streaming. The latest round of cuts represents about 4% of the media group's workforce. 
Nova Nordisk became the second ever European company to pass half a billion dollars in market value. The Danish drug maker expects a 26% jump in revenue and 29% increase in operating profits due to demand for its obesity and diabetes drugs Wegovy and Azempic. Novo's CEO says the company is well positioned to grow its patient base. We have access to some 50 million patients in the US and we are only serving a small fraction of that. So there's ample opportunity for competition and this is really about uh, growing the market, serving more patients, then uh, it's a matter of, of market share. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahira, thank you. Coming up next on the program, falling short of AI expectations. We have moved from talking about AI to applying AI at scale. That's coming up next, live from New York City. This is Bloomberg. Live from New York City, stocks a little bit softer this morning. Good morning to you. Here's the why. Three names in the pre-market down, down hard. Looking at AMD, Google, Microsoft. Alphabet down by more than 5%. We're negative here by 5.83%. From New York City, under surveillance this morning, falling short of AI expectations. It was a record quarter driven by the continued strength of Microsoft Cloud, which surpassed $33 billion in revenue, up 24%. By infusing AI across every layer of our tech stack, we are winning new customers and helping drive new benefits and productivity gains. Here's the latest this morning. Microsoft posting its strongest revenue growth since 2022, rising 18% to $62 billion. Meanwhile, Alphabet disappointing with fourth quarter revenue from its core search business. Falling short of analyst estimates, Microsoft, Google, AMD, all lower in pre-market trading today as hopes from investors over an instant AI boom begin to fizzle just a little bit. Joining us now is Stefan Slowinski, the global head of software research at BNP Paribas Exxon. Stefan, great to catch up with you, sir. Just a weakness on the ad side for Alphabet. Can we get into that? What do you think underpins that? Yeah, good morning, Jonathan. Thanks for having me on the program. So, um, you know, Google's numbers were noisy. We expected them to be noisy. Um, overall advertising revenue was a little bit light, but search was pretty much in line, growing um, a healthy 13%, YouTube growing a healthy 15%. Uh, total advertising was a little bit weak because of their other networks. I think the really interesting thing here, though, is the outlook um, Google sort of hedging themselves a little bit by saying on the advertising side, don't forget we're now $100 billion bigger in terms of revenue than we were back in 2019. So some investors may be looking at that as a signal that they're talking about maybe a bit of a slowdown to come in advertising, especially as comps get a bit harder in the back half of the year. Do you get the sense, uh, Stefan, that uh, Google has set itself up to compete on the AI front with respect to search, but also with their sort of lackluster cloud business, and I say lackluster just simply because they don't have the market share of Azure or AWS. You know, I think what Google is doing now is spreading Gen AI across all of their different services, all of their different products. And they're also trying to send a signal to the market that they're no longer just a one-trick advertising pony. Um, they've renamed their Google other business. They're calling it the subscriptions platform and devices business. Um, this is now $40 billion of revenue. Uh, growing at 20%. When you put that together with Google Cloud, the enterprise business, which did beat expectations, did reaccelerate, and is almost at a 10% margin, you now have 25% of sales coming from these two other businesses growing at above 20%. So we're about to enter a transition phase here from, for Google where we start to look at AI across all these different businesses and not just the advertising business. You know, it struck me after the earnings came out yesterday, they were really good. I mean, in any sort of vacuum, you take a look at the incredible growth and the sort of resurgence and a whole host of businesses. These are really strong businesses. The fact that shares are falling highlights just how much hopes and dreams have been baked into the share prices. How much does that really limit how much uh, higher these shares can go simply because it's gonna take time to monetize AI to the degree that a lot of people were expecting? You're absolutely right. When you look at Microsoft and Google, <clears throat> the results were, were fine. Um, it's almost like the market's looking for a bit of a reason to pull back. And that's understandable given the, the, the run that they've recently had. Um, but we do think this is a gap year for Gen AI. We had the excitement in 2023. We really get the monetization um, noticeable in 2025. So the big question is, 
will the market be patient and wait for that to come through? The one area where we are seeing monetization is in cloud computing. Um, so Microsoft Azure did see 28% growth, which was a beat. Six percentage points came from AI. Uh, Google Cloud also accelerated as, um, and, and you know, beat expectations. So that's where we think we do see the AI monetization first. What will be fascinating to see is whether or not Amazon Web Services can keep pace when they report on Thursday. They don't have the same AI partnerships that Google and Microsoft have. Obviously, Microsoft with OpenAI and Google with their own large language models. So that's where we see maybe some risk is, is more share loss for Amazon coming. So we'll be looking for that on Thursday evening. Stefan, you mentioned Microsoft. Goldman had an interesting take on where the growth is actually coming from. Allow me to share this quote with you. The stock reaction is muted as, quote, investors are likely weighing the strength of Gen AI's outsized contribution, driving six percentage points of Azure growth in the quarter against the slowing core base. Is that good news or is that bad news? What's your read on that? I think what we're seeing is, as I said before, Microsoft Azure is taking share, six, six percentage of, of, of growth coming from, uh, from AI. Um, and, and I think where there was some disappointment was the lack of detail around Copilot. Um, they basically said what ServiceNow said last week with their Gen AI product, which is we're seeing lots of interest, the fastest ramping product ever, uh, but we're only a couple of months into it. So no data around um, uh, you know, actually usage just yet. Um, I think the other thing people are concerned about today is CapEx. Uh, when you look at Microsoft and Alphabet, CapEx was up year over year by about 50% on average between the two of them. And they both said that CapEx growth from here would be notable or material. And so you're starting to get increasing concern about what those returns are going to look like on that CapEx. That was an issue we started to see last summer. Um, when you look at these stocks from a valuation basis, on a PE basis, they're still reasonable, arguably, when you include stock comp, maybe 30 times earnings this year for Microsoft, 22 for Google. But when you start to look at those free cash flow yields getting pressured by CapEx, Microsoft in particular below 3%, that's what investors are going to be looking at. When can we get the returns? When will it start to make those free cash flow yields look a bit more attractive? Are you satisfied with the cost discipline over at Alphabet? Um, you know, look, one of our themes this year is the year of efficiency turns into years of efficiency. And, and we're seeing that, right? We saw... Um, Alphabet, 1.2 billion charge in Q4 for restructuring, 700 million charge guidance for Q1 for layoffs. Um, obviously, Microsoft taking out Activision headcount, SAP last week taking out 8,000 people. These companies will be growing revenues this year, double digits, basically without growing headcount. And actually, we think that's one of the most exciting sort of underappreciated stories with Gen AI. Not what it does for these companies on the top line, it's what it does for software and tech companies on the margin as they use software development co-pilots um, to improve productivity and efficiency, and also as it helps sales and marketing efficiency. Um, so that's where we think the excitement will come this year as we see more efficiency coming through for tech stocks. Interesting final point. Stefan, great to catch up. Stefan Slowinski there of BNP Paribas. Here's the pre-market price action for you. Let's just go through the names quickly. Alphabet, Microsoft, AMD. We've got Microsoft down a little more than 1%. Alphabet is down by almost 6%. AMD is off by 66 .6. Worth pointing out again, Microsoft was up 65% over the last 12 months. Alphabet was up 60%. AMD was up 80% or something like that since the end of October, Bramo. So that gives you a picture of where things have been over the last few months. And how much of the hopes and dreams of AI and the monetization has been baked into AMD. They're a perfect example. They talk about this particular accelerator chip that could compete with NVIDIA on some level with uh, artificial intelligence. They're expecting it uh, to be more than $3.5 billion in sales this year. Sounds great, right? Wall Street was expecting $8 billion. Forget it. That's the reason why people are kind of selling the shares. What did you make of that final line? The year of efficiency is going to be years of efficiency. I think it's really important to kind of sit on that, given that we've heard uh, about layoffs at UPS, PayPal, Google, Amazon, Citi, Macy's, eBay, Microsoft, Shell, Sports Illustrated, Wayfair. The names just keep piling in. And not just that, but we heard from Microsoft yesterday. They want an AI-first workforce rather than hiring large numbers of new people to focus on technology. Just throwing it out there. What does that mean? I think we know what that means. Exactly. I think we know what that means. Equity futures right now on the S&P bouncing just a touch. We're negative about 0.5%. Coming up next, the latest Bloomberg morning consult poll from New York. This is Bloomberg.
equities down this morning. Good morning to you. Pulling back on the S&P 500. Pretty muted price action yesterday. This morning down a half of 1% on the Nasdaq 100 down by more than 1%. The real weakness in tech, we'll talk about that in a moment. The Russell doing OK. The small caps up a third of 1% this morning. In the bond market, Fed decision day, two-year, 10-year. Let's look at a two-year. Two-year closing. The day of the last Fed meeting at about 442.65. The 10-year just north of 4%. The last day the Fed met, look at us now, the 10-year, just north of 4%. We're at 4.0164% that day, 4.0279. Haven't done much in between these two meetings. Is this victory, right? Are we going to hear victory from the Federal Reserve that feels like we are getting this sort of soft landing, disinflation? Probably not. People are going to parse through the uh, outlook here. And even though Stephanie Roth thought that this would be a snoozer, I think that the big takeaway is most likely to be they are preparing for a cut. It's just unclear when. I've got nothing to sell here. Every note I've read read something like non-committal, a non-committal Chairman Powell in this meeting. Maybe that's what it is. I just remember last time, the one-two punch of Powell, we talked about it. Williams, we're not really talking about it. We're all going to ask the same question in the presser today. Are we talking about it or not? Exactly. Are they talking? And, and if they are, what are some of their parameters? And maybe Jay Powell will weigh in on the German Chancellor. <laughs> What's the German Chancellor got to say about I it all? <laughs> I don't know. I'm just thinking, you know, if, if Lagarde is going to weigh in on, why not? on US politics. Why then, not? You know. It's just so bizarre. I don't know why Lagarde is doing this over the last week. It just feels so odd, inappropriate to weigh in on US politics, given her position at the top of the ECB. I think it speaks, though, to this sort of existential question in Europe, which is how do you ignite growth further on? If you're looking at a manufacturing sector that's leveraged to China and you're looking at an energy sector that's been leveraged to Russia and now leveraged more to Qatar. So this is like some of the sort of existential questions. And maybe she's trying to address it. This is me giving her the benefit They're of the doubt. They're just all things you can say privately to European leaders. I'm not sure why you would say them publicly, repeatedly. I think you do it once. Maybe you can sit here and say, got a bit carried away on TV interviews. Sometimes we say things we don't mean. Do that lots of times. <laughs> but when day. you start to do it every other time you have an interview, you kind of take a little bit more notice, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. It was multiple times with our very own Francine Lacroix, and now it's with CNN. And she keeps going back to these core three issues, tariffs, climate, and NATO, and the defense sector in Europe. The euro right now, 108.39, negative by 0.06%. This is the distraction we're talking about that, and we're not talking about the inflation numbers, Lisa, out of the Eurozone. Which have actually been really good, right? We saw French inflation come down to the lowest uh, going back more than two years. We're talking about German inflation, the CPI print coming out at 8 a.m. Eastern time. Christine Lagarde also saying this, and this I think is interesting. It got overshadowed yesterday. Everyone on the governing council agrees the next move is a cut. That is pretty clear cut. Yes, it's basically what the market is baking in. Are we going to hear similar language uh, from the Federal Reserve, given that the inflation data is cooperating here, too? That Fed decision just around the corner. Let's get to the latest this morning. Mega cap tech earnings disappointing. Under surveillance, our top story. Microsoft reporting revenue growth at the fastest pace since 2022. Yet investors still wanting clarity on the future of AI. Google reporting weakness in its core search business, raising concerns as to how much it could continue to keep up with AI competition. And chipmaker AMD slightly in the pre-market after a weaker than expected revenue forecast as it struggles to keep up with Nvidia and Intel. AMD is down by a little more than 6%. We've done this a few times already. I think it's worth repeating. This is a name that was up something like 80% since the end of October. It's had a massive run. And people are talking about, or we're talking about, I talked to a couple tech investors who said it should be the Mag 8, it should be the Magnificent 8, and AMD is in there with them because they're developing some of these highfalutin chips. The key is they are. The key is people are ordering them. They just aren't expecting to monetize that as quickly. This is the hopes and dreams getting ahead of the reality, which takes longer to actually put out there. I'm still just astonished by how much the market is taking off. And I think is what you said, Lisa, earlier, the fact that it's the expectations almost too high. I read it in one of the notes is that someone said it's healthy, but not robust enough. But it's pretty healthy when you look at some of these numbers. Let's turn to our next story. Mention the Fed. Here's the highlight for you. Investors expecting the Fed to hold rates steady. Hoping they'll get some guidance from Chair Jay Powell about when cuts could begin when he speaks at 2.30 Eastern time. Markets pushing back bets since the December decision with a 40% chance of cuts in March. The Fed facing stronger than expected economic data, yet a clearer path towards 2% inflation after numbers just last week. A final story here. Former President Donald Trump expanding his lead over President Joe Biden in key swing states ahead of November's presidential election. The latest Bloomberg Morning Consult poll showing Trump leading in all seven swing states. Voter concerns about immigration gaining ground on the economy is the top issue. 
AMH, six in ten swing state voters say President Joe Biden bears responsibility for a surge in migrants at the U.S.-Mexico border. Yeah, this latest installation of our poll shows for the first time that more voters than previous surveys we've conducted, along with uh, Morning Consult, that immigration is their top issue. And then you ask them who's to blame for immigration. It's President Joe Biden, as well as Democrats in Congress. One thing to note, though, a caveat. A lot of th what the survey shows is that voters in these swing states also understand the root causes of immigration. They also talk about the fact that they do know that this is due to famine or chaos in some of the countries they're leaving. But this is going to be a massive issue for the Biden administration. And it's why you see Trump harping on it and campaigning on it and telling the law Republican lawmakers in Congress not to give Joe Biden a border deal. Let's turn to the former president. Greg Vallier of AGF Investments weighing in on Trump's influence, writing this. Members of both parties are stunned by Donald Trump's audacity. He's calling the shots on Capitol Hill, bullying the rookie Mike Johnson in the House and the frail Mitch McConnell in the Senate. Trump may single-handedly block an immigration bill. Greg joins us now for more. Greg, is that your base case now for this year, for the year ahead? I think so. I mean, there's an outside chance, John, that we could revive uh, an immigration bill, but I wouldn't put it at much more than 20 percent. It's a long shot. Well, Greg, when you look at what's going on right now in Congress, please help us contextualize this. The House is on the path to impeach Secretary Mayorkas, the same individual who is negotiating with Senate Republicans to try to get a border deal done. Is this appropriate? How does this make any sense? It, it, to me, it is another signal that the House does not want a, a bill, uh, as we've all been talking about for the last couple of weeks, that Donald Trump uh, wants to keep the issue for himself uh, for November. And it looks like he's 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 got it. And, you know, guys, I have to say, after looking at those polling numbers, as of now, Trump is the front runner. If the election were held tonight, tr I think Trump would win fairly comfortably. There's one caveat to our poll, which is the vulnerability of Trump if he is convicted. Uh, you know, he's facing four of those indictments, 91 charges. But back to the border, if there is such a strong deal that comes out of the Senate and the House decides to vote it down, will voters in November it blame those House Republicans and potentially vote them out? They could. I, I, I think the House is going to flip them back to the Democrats. And ironically, I think the Senate is going to flip back to the uh, Republicans. But it, it, it may have some impact. People may see how cynical a move this has been by the president. But I, I, I don't think he can count on that as an attitude in the public. When we look forward to uh, November, when do some of these polls start to matter the most to you? When do you start to look more carefully and say this is predictive of a potential outcome? Well, certainly by the end of August, Labor Day has always traditionally been, you know, a time where you've got to look carefully at the polls. So he, there still is time. There still is time for uh, the public to feel the economy is getting better. There's still an outside shot for an immigration deal. But there's a lot of potholes, including potentially a nasty dust up between the U.S. and Iran. Let's go there, actually, Greg, because we did hear from the president that he has decided on some sort of action. Do you have any... In, uh, insight into what that could potentially be or, or what the advantage is in signaling we've made our decision now we all just wait and try to identify what it is yeah i think if the wait is is a long one people would just use that time to be critical of uh, uh biden saying that he was timid that he hasn't moved aggressively there are a couple of interesting issues number one would the white house seek permission from Congress, probably would not. And number two, would the strikes by the U.S. be on Iranian soil or in the Persian Gulf? Just how much, how far into Iran could we get? If it is, I think the Iranians will retaliate pretty aggressively. Greg, can we finish where we started, just on the border issue? If the former president wants this as an issue to run on, and he's going to hold back Republicans in Congress on coming to any kind of agreement with Democrats in the Senate or in the House, for that matter, Greg, do you think the president has any power whatsoever, any executive power, to do something about the mess that is the southern border? Yes. I mean, I, I think, John, that one of the problems over the last few months has been the White House hasn't had a plan. But there is there is an opportunity where they could just unilaterally shut down the border. I mean, Biden could do something dramatic. But on this issue, at least, it, it hasn't been uh, we haven't seen it. But the president is saying that he needs congressional approval to do that. And if that were true, then why didn't Trump do that when he said he would when he came into office? 
again, I think Trump wanted to keep the issue alive. I mean, as long as he keeps this issue alive, it usually uh, works to uh, Trump's favor. But Greg, wouldn't this be just a slew of, uh, this would be held up in courts? Wouldn't there be a number of uh, legal issues if the president of the United States came out and absolutely shut down the border? Yes, and, and I think that it would hurt commerce. There's a lot of unintended consequences if he did that. Uh, so I, I think Biden is stuck. We're, we're at a point now where uh, there's not enough time to get a sweeping proposal done. I mean, there's a deal there, uh, HR2. I mean, there is a deal, but this deal would be totally unacceptable to most Democrats. Hey, Greg, great to get your view. Greg Van Lier there of HF Investments. MH on the options. For the president. Yeah, that's right. I think you know, this White House is not going to shut down the border without getting that emergency authority from Congress. The former president also said he was going to shut down the border. And the only time we saw him do that is when he used Title 42 and it became a public health issue with COVID. So this president is starting to sound like the old president saying, I will shut down the border, but he's still asking for that congressional approval. The president can't get a break. Consumer confidence starting to pick up. The economy was the big issue, and now all of a sudden immigration's catching up and the southern border's an absolute mess. Yeah, absolutely. The White House definitely wants you to read what happened yesterday with the conference board, the Michigan sentiment. The economy is starting to feel better, but that's also why maybe people are starting to say, the economy is no longer my biggest issue. I'm starting to feel better. Inflation is coming down, or the rate of inflation is coming down. So now I'm more concerned about immigration. We should also note, and there's data to support this, depending on what newspapers you read or what television stations you watch, immigration is much more important, say, on some conservative media outlets than it is on others. So people are being bombarded with this story as well. I just wonder if anyone's going to blink an eye at the fact that they might not pass a deal simply because it is politically inexpedient. That, to me, I wonder how that's going to play in the polls. Isn't that just Washington for you? Well, it's a new level of cynicism. You know? What yeah. is really insane is that they've been arguing about an immigration deal. This, this could be a generational deal. For decades, they've sure. been talking about this, and they may blow it just because an election is coming up. That's the latest in D.C. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Yahara Hackers. Hey, Yahara. Hi, John. Saudi Arabia is considering plans to revive a follow-on offering in Aramco as soon as next month. The multi-billion dollar deal is likely to run a rank amongst the biggest share sales in recent years, according to Bloomberg sources. The kingdom raised $30 billion in its Aramco IPO four years ago. Shares in fast fashion retailer H&M are lower after the company missed fourth quarter profit estimates and surprised the street with a new CEO. Company veteran Daniel Erber will take over from Helena Helmerson, who saw the company lose a fifth of its value during her four-year tenure. Erber has been with the company for a decade and for the last four years was responsible for the H&M brand. Activist investor Nelson Peltz has a plan to fix Disney's profitability in streaming, and it involves bundles. Peltz's firm, Try and Fund Management, will recommend the company seek to bundle its ESPN Plus service with a larger player interested in sports, such as Netflix. Try and control, controls close to $3 billion in Disney shares and is seeking two seats on Disney's board. And that's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahara, thank you. Bramo, back to the future. How many times have we said that? Back I, to the bundle. That's exactly what I was thinking about. Michael Nathanson, what does the successful model look like for sports? The old model, what we yeah. had before all of this stuff. This is my big suggestion. <laughs> exactly. Right? It's just, uh, it drives me nuts. Up next on the program, the Fed decision just around the corner. He's going to be data dependent. They have two more inflation prints before the March meeting. I still don't think they're actually going to, going to be cutting in March. They're not really in a rush. Live from New York City this morning, that conversation up next. You're watching Bloomberg TV. Tech stocks struggling just a little bit this morning, so we're pulling back on the S&P 500 by something like a half of 1%. On the Nasdaq, down about one full percentage point. In the bond market, basically unchanged. Your 10-year, 4.0298%. Yields are going nowhere. Under surveillance this morning, the Fed decision just around the corner. He's going to be data dependent. They have two more inflation prints before the March meeting. I still don't think they're actually going to, going to be cutting in March. They're not really in a rush. The data have been pretty good. They'll be talking about the the converse, talking about talking about QT, and the, you know that will probably kick off in in June. 
Big banks split on the timing of the first rate cut. Bank of America and Goldman expecting March. City, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan looking for June. Bruce Kasman, Chief Economist and Head of Global Economic Research at JP Morgan, joins us now for more. Bruce, let's talk about this. The Fed decision today, with expectations high, we get some kind of guidance about maybe a March rate cut. At the same time on Friday, we're looking for payrolls growth still close to 200K. How do you reconcile those two things, Bruce? Well, I think what the Fed's going to do today is open a door, but basically tell us it hasn't decided when it's going to walk through it. And I think there's a story here about inflation coming down that's encouraging them. But there's also a story about the economy looking pretty strong here, which is raising questions about how restrictive actually the five and a half percent policy stance is. They're going to grapple with that, I think, for a while. Uh, I think the data is going to tell the tale. Uh, we've got as noted, two, two CPI reports before the March meeting. We got two payroll reports. We're looking for a strong payroll report on Friday. I think most likely the strength of growth uh, and I think some firming in, in goods price inflation we're expecting is going to slow the Fed down and, and have them wait in March. Bruce, we've got plenty of questions around the table about the labour market, so let's talk about it a little bit more. You're looking for north of 200k, I think, on Friday. The median estimate in our survey at the moment is 185. Unemployment's below 4%. I think you've raised the right question. What evidence is there that we ask, quote, sufficiently restrictive, given what we're seeing in the labour market? Well, I think it's, it's an interesting question. I think they will use that language in the statement today, sufficiently restrictive. Many FOMC members have been basically emphasizing that policy is at a restrictive stance and should start to come down. But the economy did very well at the end of last year. It's carrying continued strength into the start of the year. I think the labor market is showing some re reduction in churning, some reduction in labor demand. But there is demand starting to pick up in some sectors of the economy. And I think job growth is going to stay strong here. I think the unemployment rate is going to stay uh, below 4%. So I think they got a tough balancing act here. How they talk to us about that balancing act between inflation progress, strength of growth, and importantly, how they interpret financial conditions becomes really the, uh, the color we're going to get today in terms of thinking about where they stand. I find this labor market incredibly confusing right now, and I'd love your help to try to understand it because you see it as stronger uh, than the average person on Wall Street. We've heard about those slew of layoffs, UPS, PayPal, Google, Amazon, City, Macy's. You can go on and on. Yesterday, we got the JOLTS data, the job openings data, and when you look beneath the hood, you can see the level of quits, people actually quitting, fell to the lowest, the rate, going back to 2020. At what point are we seeing real-time weakening that just isn't making its way into the overall headline data? So I think we have to distinguish between a normalization and weakening. And remember, the labor market was unusual over 2021 through early 2023, as we were really normalizing back after a COVID shock that was quite profound. Uh, so what I think we're seeing now is pace of job growth slow. I think we're seeing less people leave jobs. I think we're seeing wage inflation come off of very high levels. But I think we're also seeing in the high frequency data a sense that things are starting to stabilize and stabilize at a reasonably strong pace, consistent with the fact that the unemployment rate's below 4%, consistent with the fact that the economy is growing at a 3% pace here. So I think we have to be a little careful not to get carried away by momentum that's reflecting the normalization after outsized strength in the labor market over the last two years. How do we know that we've really killed the potential for a wage price spiral if we do see this ongoing strength underpinning, yes, albeit some kind of uh, peripheral layoffs, but otherwise, as you say, a very strong labor market? I, I think the term wage price spiral is too extreme in terms of what the debate is right now. I think we've seen that the shocks that pushed wage inflation up, that pushed inflation up, many of them have gone from the scene and we're not sitting with a threat that inflation is going to be four or five percent. I think we're debating within a range of is inflation settling back towards the Fed's targeted two or are we getting stuck somewhere around three? And there's a story there which we're seeing with wage inflation, which looks like it's still running above four percent. And you're asking, well, how well is productivity doing? How much pricing power do companies have? whether the big drops in goods pricing we've seen in the last few months is a bit of a temporary phenomenon, and how much further progress are we going to see on shelter costs, service price inflation? And these are all questions which we haven't answered yet. But we're debating with the, the point about is inflation coming all the way back to the low twos, or is it getting stuck somewhere around three? And neither of those is a wage price spiral. That's not really the, the dynamic of this economy right now. Uh, but 3% inflation is too high for the Fed, and we'll 
certainly slow them down if not stop them, if that's what the data starts to show. Bruce, I just wonder how relevant the Federal Reserve actually is to this conversation. <laughs> We've talked about them so much over the last two years. It's interesting, isn't it? Just how rate sensitive is this economy? If higher rates didn't slow it down, will lower rates speed it up? Bruce, I don't know the answer to that. How relevant is the Fed? I think that's a really important question. And I would just say two things here. First of all, I think last year we had a very significant drag coming from higher interest rates on housing, other durable spending. Uh, monetary policy did do damage, but it was offset by fiscal stimulus. It was offset by sharp falls in energy prices, uh, and it was offset by still benefits of COVID normalization. I think now we're in a really interesting position because monetary conditions are still tight. Borrowing rates are still high. Bank lending standards have tightened, but financial conditions have eased a lot. And that juxtaposition of tight monetary conditions and easing financial conditions is really unprecedented and how it plays out in economic performance is uncertain. So I think in that regard, your question is really spot on. This is a really tough, tough economy to get your hands around in terms of what the Fed's transmission is doing as we look to 2024. I'm so pleased you brought that up because I'd introduce another dynamic as well. This conversation today about higher real interest rates, the Fed sort of allowing passive tightening as inflation comes down and keeps nominal rates steady. Bruce, is that offset by better real incomes in America? Well, first of all, I think it's wrong to say that there's a mechanical link between inflation and real interest rates. That depends on how people think about the forward path of inflation. It depends on how interest rate markets, as we discussed a minute ago, are feeding through the financial conditions. But I do think the point you're making is an important one. The rise, the fall in inflation is a reduction of a set of supply shocks that hit us. As that's happening, that's a boost to um, household purchasing power. And we can see the consumer respond to that. The good news is that income is also being generated by the, uh, the corporate sector right now. It's not a move away from uh, corporate profits as we're generating strong demand overall. And as we're generating what has been pretty good productivity uh, outcomes, we're looking for a 3% quarterly gain in the fourth quarter productivity print tomorrow, which would be pretty impressive. Just quickly, Bruce, to wrap this up, economics tries to be agnostic when it comes to politics, and it tries to look <laughs> at these very uh, specific uh, issues and, and calibrations of inflation and labor markets. But it's hard to avoid the politics this year. A lot of people saying the Fed is going to try to get an earlier start to avoid uh, cutting rates more aggressively right into the election. We're also, though, hearing from Congress members, Sherrod Brown, the latest, in the Senate saying, I urge the Federal Reserve to cut rates. How difficult does that make the situation for the Fed? How does that factor into your considerations? So I think we should not consider the Fed as having an explicit political lens in terms of their policy setting. But the Fed is, a, is operating in a political environment. And I think there is a sensitivity there that if the Fed was slow in, in, in lowering rates and the economy did falter uh, as we moved into the election um, campaign season, that they'd be politically vulnerable. So I do think there's a bit of a bias here that if they think they're going to ease, that they probably started a little earlier. Uh, that does weigh on our thinking. It hasn't pushed us to think they'll go all the way in March. But I, I do think that's a consideration we should have in our minds. Hey, Bruce, it's great to catch up to get your thoughts. Bruce Kasman there of JP Morgan. We mentioned that just the other day, Lisa. When you're looking at the back half, I think it was City looking for more than 100 basis points of rate cuts in the back half of 2024. It does raise the question... OK, so you think we wait until June and then they go 100 basis points going into the November election. That one is a little bit of a head scratcher. There's a should. What should they do from a purely economic level and what will they do? And the issue is economics cannot be divorced from politics at the end of the day because there are a lot of other considerations, especially if, uh, to Bruce's point, they are becoming political li uh, politically vulnerable if they do make some sort of dramatic action before the election. Imagine what the other side are going to start saying in the election campaign. I just find it so tremendously unhelpful. If I was at the Federal Reserve right now, I'd be so frustrated that they were even sending those letters into Chairman Powell. I would agree. I imagine that frustration is long simmering when the Fed is always used as sort of a punching bag for a lot of concepts that are hard to translate in some sort of mass consumption way. How do you talk about the real rate and the neutral rate and cutting sure. rates down to that and the disinflation versus just the overall inflation? It's not an easy political message. Thank you, Sherrod Brown. Coming up in the next hour, Sebastian Page of T. Rowe Price, Wei Lee of BlackRock, George Ferguson of Bloomberg Intelligence, and a whole lot more. From New York City this morning, good morning. Equity futures trying to bounce off session lows. We're down here by 0.5%.
This is the Super Bowl for investors this week, not only with tech earnings, but with a flurry of macro data as well. The Magnificent Seven are actually delivering on the promise. These are also the companies that are growing far beyond the broad market. I think the risk to this year is that actually growth could be better than, than people think, rather than the opposite. Our take is good news is good news. It's not good news, it's bad news. We're done with that. It really is a winner-takes-it-all economy. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. Live from New York City this morning, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Lisa Abramowitz together with Anne-Marie Hordern. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P 500 negative here by 0.5%. We can talk about big tech later. Front and centre this afternoon, a Federal Reserve decision just around the corner. Will they or won't they talk about rate cuts? And what kind of guidance can they give at a time where it's not really a question of if they're going to cut rates, it's a question of when, even though we have incredibly strong economic data in a U.S. economy that seems to be firing on a lot of cylinders. Senator Warren would like them to talk about rate cuts. The Senate Banking Committee Chair, Sherrod Brown, would also like them to talk about rate cuts. Democrats weighing in on Chairman Powell's decision today, which is just beyond inappropriate and increasingly bizarre. <laughs> You know, I just shrugged this off a little bit because it's not new. We've heard this from the Sen these senators before, and obviously it's before the big decision day. But you have to separate the fact that Sherrod Brown is up against a huge, actually, election. It's going to be very tight for him. They are grandstanding. The issue that this becomes for Powell is it's an election year. And what does this mean the Republicans are going to say on the other either side? Well, and they've been jawboned on both sides, right? I mean, every single president seems to uh, try to push them in one direction or another to try to help them economically. The key question, though, as Bruce Kasman was talking about, is how much does this influence the Fed to get ahead of that three-month stretch of before the elections and start cutting earlier, despite the fact that the labor market looks strong? Yes, inflation is coming down, but still a lot of positivity out of the economy. The optics were already tremendously difficult. This just makes it harder. We said in the last hour, it's worth repeating, it was inappropriate under the Trump administration. It's inappropriate now. It's even more stupid now because they're about to cut interest rates anyway. That's what I don't get about this. You think about where the economy is. Unemployment's south of 4%. The inflation trends are improving. We're seeing inflation slow. The Federal Reserve's in a position now where it can consider pulling back on interest rates. We all know that it's an election year. This makes it so much more harder than it needs to be. That's why it's just even more inappropriate this time around. I completely agree. It makes me wonder why. And it makes me realize it's so difficult to communicate the strength in the face of a lot of dissatisfaction among a lot of consumers, but that is starting to shift. And a number of analysts are saying, just wait, you know, in a couple months, people will get used to the 20% increase in CPI. I think you're totally right. I think you're totally right, though. If the Fed waits to closer to the election, it's going to get very political. Remember when Biden just a few months ago said the Fed shouldn't hike anymore and how much blowback he got just for that comment about basically seeing what everyone else was seeing, which this is likely the end of the rate hike cycle. Imagine he cuts a month or two or three months before November. It makes it harder, that's for sure. Here's the price action this morning, just to get you up to speed. Equity futures pulling back by a half of 1% on the S&P 500. Equities on the Nasdaq, a whole lot lower. The tech results, Lisa, it's hard to call them disappointing. It's just disappointing relative to very, very high expectations following a monster rally across some of these names. That's what we learned yesterday, was that expectations are incredibly high and there's sort of a price to perfection type of feel in markets right now. So the question is how far does that go and how high is the threshold for some of these names to keep driving gains, given the fact that they have been the dominant players with respect to delivering S&P returns and Nasdaq returns over the past 12 months. That's the equity market. The Nasdaq there down by more than 1%. Let's just finish on the bond market briefly. Give you a snapshot of where Treasuries are at the moment. The 10-year in America shaping up as follows. Your 10-year this morning looks a little something like this. Yields are lower by not even a basis point, 4.026% on a 10-year this morning. Coming up on the program, building towards the Fed decision with Sebastian Page of T. Rowe Price and Wei Li of BlackRock. Microsoft and Google falling in the pre-market. We'll catch up with Bloomberg's Mandeep Singh. And the latest from Boeing, we'll be catching up with Bloomberg's George Ferguson a little bit later on this morning. We begin with our top story this morning, counting down to the Fed decision at 2 p.m. Eastern time. On the timing of the first rate cut, Wall Street is divided. I think June is where the market has gravitated to. Call it June. 
maybe July. We definitely wouldn't rule out March. What gets them to cut in March is the inflation data. Our base case in the U.S. is for a rate cut in the second half of 2024. I think the Fed's thinking probably June at the earliest. By the end of the year, they will start cutting. We have penciled in a May start. We've always had them cutting interest rates around the middle of this year. Our baseline is June. Rate cuts in the first quarter very much seems unjustified. Do they go in March? Probably not. March just seems a little premature. I still don't think they're actually going to be cutting in March. Investors looking ahead to Jay Powell's news conference at 2.30 Eastern time for clues on the Fed's rate path. Sebastian Page at T. Rowe Price saying his base case for the U.S. economy is a soft landing, adding it's important to stay invested and diversified. Goalkeepers are twice as likely to save a penalty if they stay in the middle of the goal rather than dive to one side or the other. Sebastian Page joins us now for more. Seb, good morning to you. Love the analogy. Uh, it was for you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> you know, they, Appreciate they, it. They studied 286 top league penalty kicks. Yep. The goalkeeper stays in the middle only 2% of the time, but they're twice as likely to block the kick. Isn't that incredible? Yeah, so we're in the middle. We're neutral between stocks and bonds at the moment. Does that apply to Chairman Powell today as well then? Stay in the middle? I, I think absolutely. So you're looking at a coin flip for March in terms of rate cuts. I don't think he wants to surprise the market on either side. Historically, the Fed likes to surprise with cuts, not with hikes. So you could say, okay, historical pattern, maybe they're going to, if they're going to err on one side, it's going to be on the dovish side. But you know what? This is equities an all-time high. Wage growth, Atlanta wage, wage trackers, 5%, right? It's a strange moment to try to deliver a dov, dovish surprise. And I don't think the political pressures are going to influence that. You said this in your note, and I think this is really important. Markets at all-time highs sounds expensive. Stocks up 2% in the last two years sounds cheap. How do you view this market? What's the best way of framing things? You know, framing really matters, right? I'll give you another one. If you look at the Magnificent Seven being up 80%, up 107% in 2022, you'll say stocks are really, really expensive, all-time high. If you look at the MSCI All Country World Index, which has small caps in there, it has emerging markets in there, its price earnings ratio on my Bloomberg terminal is 19 and a half. And that is actually the 30-year average. So markets are kind of fully priced, but not outrageously expensive. It really depends which lens you look at. How much does the future path of returns on this broad index really depend on what the Fed does? Or are they kind of out of the picture now? And it really does come down to the earnings. I think the earnings matter a great deal. But, you know, saying the Fed is out of the picture would be a really, really controversial statement because markets really follow the Fed. We're looking at rate cuts. I think the risk is to the upside on inflation. If you ask me what's my biggest risk for 2024 would be that inflation surprises on the upside. I'm not talking 9, 10% like we had, but I think this is where most of the risk is, and that flows through Fed policy, maybe holding back a little bit on cuts. So what becomes most vulnerable if the Fed doesn't deliver six rate cuts or five rate cuts, but goes for, say, two or three? You know, here's the thing. It, and you were talking about expectations earlier. So a really wise person once told me that the secret to happiness in life is low expectations. And you were just saying, well, Jonathan, expectations are really high. So I think if, you know, the tenure could, could go up, it's the discount rate effect, and both stocks and bonds could, could go down. I'm not that pessimistic, by the way. You know, we're looking at rate cuts. You've been constructive we're, recently. A little bit more. Haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, but the problem, it goes back to valuation. I mean, look at the equity. Let's talk about framing a little bit more. Right? Sure. Look at the equity risk premium. So you take the price earnings ratio on stocks. It's like near 20 on the S&P 500. That's a 5% earnings yield. That's the same yield you get on cash. So when you compare stocks with bonds and the fact that bonds have gotten cheaper, you're in a situation where the equity risk premium is most compressed it's been since 2007. So I've gotten more constructive on the economy with everyone else and the consumer. You know, now with wages growing at 4 or 5% and inflation going down to 2%, real wages are coming up. But at the same time, all of this is priced in. So everything's awesome, right? The VIX is at 13. Tom, Tom's not here, but he would tell us the VIX is at 13. Tom would there's, quote that yes, right now. You're right. <laughs> there's complacency. The We're looking at rate cuts. We're looking at 10%. 11% earnings growth. Everything feels good. There's a hot war in the Middle East. 
And I think that's where, again, flowing back to the inflation risk is a commodity. Well, let's go back to that hot war. Let's talk about that. I think we've all been surprised by how subdued, how calm things have been. Maybe not in equities, but more so in the commodity market. See crude basically unmoved by all of this. You don't sound unmoved by all of this. How concerned are you? I'm with you. You know I watch the show every day, and I know you've been talking about yeah. this a lot. I'm with you. I don't think oil prices are reflecting the risk of supply disruption. I'm not a geopolitical analyst. When I talk to geopolitical analysts, they're telling me any kind of supply disruption could be substantial, especially if it's in the Strait of Hormuz, where you get 21% of the uh, oil flow, oil transport going through the Strait of Hormuz. The risks there are real, and the trend is not our friend. It, the, things are escalating, they're not de-escalating. Uh, Ian Bremmer, I know he's a, fan, he's a friend of the show. Ian Bremmer put something out yesterday on LinkedIn saying, look, uh, expect a aggressive intervention on Iranian military operations installations, you know, in the next day or so. I, I don't know if he's right or not. Again, I'm not the geopolitical expert, but you, you can see all the risks spile up. The cost of shipping a 40-foot container from Shanghai to New York four weeks ago is about $3,000. Yeah, but it's $6,000 now. How do you hedge that? I mean, basically, do you buy energy stocks or do you just sit there and say aggressively neutral and happily neutral and just hope for the best? You know, Lisa, to your price, we like technology. If, if we have, we don't, you know, we're trying not to have a bias, but we are followed technology very closely and we have a lot of r really good growth investing strategies. Right now, our research platform is long energy. And as an asset allocator, I look at this and this is a real signal. So in our asset allocation portfolios, we have an overweight to a real asset equity strategy, which is basically combining energy stocks with uh, real estate metals and mining and precious metals. And it's maybe not in fashion right now because inflation's coming down, so it's more of a tail risk hedge, but I think it's got its place in the portfolio right now. We saw a Houthi attack yesterday on a, on a vessel that the U.S. military was able to strike down. We continuously see that, yet oil's not moving. It needs to actually hit supply, but aren't these vessels just going to go around Africa to continue to make sure that supply is safe? Yeah, and that ultimately creates, obviously, inflation pressures. Look, on supply, first of all, you have weak demand, I think, is what's going on here. And you, you also talk about the 13 million barrels a day of supply from the U.S. So this is like an all-time high. You mentioned this before. But I think it's very fragile. And any disruption, the, the, the risk is just not symmetrical. You know, could, could oil go back to 50 or could it go up to 100? You know, I'll, <laughs> I think the risk is skewed to the upside. Seb, stick with us. Crude is down again today by more than 1%. 76.92 on WTI. Brent crude right now, 81.92. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg brief with Yahara Hackers. Hey, Yahara. Hi, John. The PGA Tour is set to confirm approval of a $3 billion investment by U.S. Strategic Sports Group, according to the Financial Times. The investment group is led by Liverpool Football Club and Boston Red Sox owner John Henry through his Fenway Sports Group. The agreement is set to include an equity participation for the players and values the new entity at roughly $12 billion, according to the report. And House Republicans are moving toward impeaching Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, a GOP panel approving two articles of impeachment, sending the vote to the House floor. However, the effort is likely to die in the Senate. Mayorkas is in the hot seat as security at the U.S.-Mexico border remains a hot-button issue. Media mogul Byron Allen has made a $14.3 billion offer for all of Paramount's outstanding shares. Allen is offering to pay a 50% premium for voting stock, according to people familiar with his terms. Including existing debt, the total value of the deal tops about $30 billion. In a statement to Bloomberg News, Allen Media Group says this offer, quote, is the best solution for all of Paramount Global shareholders and the bid should be taken seriously and pursued. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahira, thank you. Coming up next on the program, tech falling short of AI-fueled expectations. We continue to invest responsibly in our data centers and compute to support this new wave of growth in AI-powered services for us and for our customers. That conversation is coming up next, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. You're watching Bloomberg TV.
equities on the S&P 500 pulling back by 0.5%. It is Fed decision day. Your bond market yields lower by a single basis point, 4.02% on a 10-year. Under surveillance this morning, tech falling short of AI-fueled expectations. Search, YouTube and cloud are supported by our state-of-the-art compute infrastructure. We continue to invest responsibly in our data centers and compute to support this new wave of growth in AI-powered services for us and for our customers. Here's the latest this morning. Alphabet shares falling in the pre-market after revenue for the company's core search business fell short of estimates. The results coming amid uncertainty surrounding Google's plans for generative AI and increased competition from Microsoft. Mandeep Singh, senior technology analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence, joins us around the table. Morning, Mandeep. Let's go through these numbers together. Yeah. They're not terrible. Strongest revenue growth over at Microsoft since 2022. Cloud services sales gaining 30%. Was this just the bar being too high? It was. And look, if you parse through the numbers, uh, they told us, you know, 6% uh, revenue from generative AI workloads. That was 3% last quarter. So which, what that means is it went from 2 billion to 4 billion in a quarter. Now that's NVIDIA type growth. If you try to, you know, model where those GPUs are going and that too in inferencing. Remember, all these companies are trying to train their LLMs right now. Microsoft has a stack where they are actually deploying this in AI agents, and this is all inferencing revenue. I think where they fell short of expectations was the co-pilot side. That didn't drive upside in, in that productivity segment, but I, I think if this is any reflection, the trend is going to continue. So this is the AI assistant yes. on your PC. How helpful is it? Well, so that's where, uh, you know, it's, it didn't translate into revenue because uh, people are still trying to figure out how to integrate it in their workflow. Remember, this can do summaries, this can help you do long-form searches, and it's still new. But where they are finding traction is companies looking to use their own data within the enterprise and building agents. That's what they mean by inferencing. And that OpenAI Microsoft stack is resonating in the market, whereas others are still developing. I mean, Google, I think Amazon numbers are gonna be key because to me, Microsoft is clearly uh, taking share in cloud from Amazon. We were just hearing that too, especially because Amazon doesn't necessarily have the artificial intelligence capabilities that Microsoft and Google have. How do you gauge the fact that yes, these numbers are completely solid, and yet people are responding badly to them. Does that mean that the market-based expectations are unrealistic? Or does it mean they've just been brought forward a year, two years, and things are just going to meander along in the meantime? I mean, look at what happened with NVIDIA last year, right? It traded at the premium multiple, and, uh, you know, they kept beating expectations. So in this case, I think, yes, Microsoft is trading at over 30 times PE. It's rich historically. But if they keep delivering on the Azure number, it's now 5% of their Azure revenue. It, and that keeps growing at this pace. I, I think uh, they can maintain that premium multiple. There also is a question of layoffs and sort of how they're going to make their business more efficient. We heard about Google layoffs. And then this from the CFO of Microsoft talking about the company pivoting to an AI first uh, workforce rather than hiring large numbers of new people to focus on the technology. Is this going to be AI? AI, AI person, AI, AI at Microsoft? I think it's too early for that. Look, they have to manage the margins. One of the biggest risks going into the print was their gross margins are going to get hurt because they are buying all this GPU capacity. I mean, remember, they raised their CapEx last night by 40%. And, and so this is huge. A, a digital transformation drove like 15 to 20% growth in CapEx for cloud guys. Now we are talking about 40% from AI. So all that CapEx is going to kind of increase the cost of revenue and they have to manage the margins, which they said are going to grow 1% to 2%. So that's what Street wanted to hear, that margin impact would be minimal. I'm just happy you threw a person in there, sort of AI, <laughs> AI person. I mean, I, AI, I figure, I mean, AI. that's, it's basically, you know, the desk, it's like, you know, auto-operated, auto-operated, auto-operated. Sure human sitting there lonely. You know, that's sort of the image. Not all days, I think, 10 years away. I, I don't think... Uh, that's I don't think it's that like. soon. Not so soon. But one thing we could get, Sebastian, I think this is a big change. Someone mentioned it in the previous hour. You could get real growth here at some of these companies, and they don't have to have the headcount grow at all based on some of the changes we're looking at. How important is that to you? I think expectations are high for how much efficiency AI is going to deliver. And I believe in it. I believe in the efficiency. McKinsey's putting out numbers in the $3 trillion 
efficiency gains. This is the size of the UK GDP. Okay, so they're high expectations. These are great companies. They print cash flows. Right now, we're neutral between growth and value. In fact, we're, gonna, we're starting to lean towards value a little bit more. Not because we don't like AI and all the efficiency gains and the productivity gains, just because we like to lean against the wind. And right now, the value stocks relative to the growth stocks are starting to look way more. Everyone else likes AI. Everyone else yes. seems to be on the same side yes. of the boat at the moment. That's been the feeling over the last 12 months. You said 10 years, 10 years before we see these big changes. Where does that number come from? Well, just uh, looking at how AI is getting deployed. Look, uh, right now, the focus is on infrastructure. Everyone is investing in infrastructure to uh, feed the data, to develop their models. All this is going to translate into software. It's going to be one step at a time. And then we are going to talk about robotics or you know, somebody who can uh, take the jobs or you know, automate that. So it's going to happen in steps. Enterprise changes happen slowly than you know, what people expect. But I think this is a real trend. And that's what you're going to find out you know, from these companies pivoting to AI. What do you think the biggest surprise is going to be when we get the results after uh, Meta, after Apple, after Amazon tomorrow? Who are you expecting to really sort of set a new tone other than good results, solid, just not good enough for some of the hopes and dreams? Well, so look at the advertising side, right? We are going through a big change on the advertising side because uh, these companies can't use third-party data anymore. Cookies are going to be deprecated. That will be a headwind for someone like Alphabet. And, and they are trying to pivot to AI agents to mine more data. So. On the ad side, you are going to see changes. YouTube, I think, is uh, going to blow through the numbers simply because streaming and connected TV is a real trend. You're going to see uh, a nice acceleration on that front. So you are seeing that ad revenue shift over to streaming and all these AI agents over time, and, and that will be a big change. One company we've not mentioned, Apple, reporting after the close tomorrow. Sebastian, can we finish on that? What's happened with the smartphone? business and the companies associated with it. Have we met that saturated point, that saturation point we've all been worried about for a while? Well, part of it in this case is China. Look, I think that we haven't seen, Mandeep maybe you can comment on this, but we haven't seen significant innovation in that space in a little while. The phones are starting to look and feel the same and you kind of reach saturation. So Jonathan, I think, I think we're getting there. But we're talking about a wonderful company that has a lot of innovation in the pipeline as well. Sebastian Page, Seb, good to catch up. Great thank to you. get your thoughts alongside Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence. Mandeep, thank you. Coming up on this program, coming up next, George Ferguson, the Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Aerospace and Defense Analyst, joining us to break down Boeing earnings and the company's response to the 737 MAX 9 crisis. Ramo, all of that and more, but Boeing in a tough, tough spot. Yeah, I just love the idea. This isn't good enough to better Apple. This is sort of getting boring, right? I mean, that's sort of what we keep hearing, that we want something that, you know, is implanted in our brains and can and no, we export don't. us. No, we don't. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's what I'm saying, though. It's sort of, you know, uh, what can you do for us now? Mandeep. <laughs> You're going to weigh in on that. Do you want a brain, brain no, implant? I, I think you're, you want the LLMs to run on your phone. That's the next step of evolution. And, and it's going to happen. Apple is going to do it. Been waiting for it. Yeah. Not the brain implant, yeah. although some people might think that's, <laughs> that's needed. But anyway, that's a story for another time. Equities on the S&P 500, negative here by 0.5%. Into the bond market, shaping up as follows. Treasury yields coming down by almost a single basis point on a 10-year, 4.0241% on a 10-year this morning. In the FX market, the euro slightly negative. We're down 0.1% at 108.34. Waiting for the White House response to the deadly attack over the weekend and still crude lower by more than 1%, Anne-Marie, 77 on WTI. It is Fed Decision Day, live from New York City. Here's the state of play. The scores for you on the S&P 500. Equity futures negative here by 0.5%. Underperformance from tech in the pre-market, dragging the Nasdaq down by more than one full percentage point. We get more from technology tomorrow after the close with Meta 
Amazon and Apple. The small cap's doing OK, positive here by a third of 1%. In the bond market, two-year, 10-year, 30-year shaping up as follows. The 10-year yield is unchanged at 4.0279%. The two-year yield is lower by a single basis point, 432 on a two-year. And to finish on a foreign exchange, just a final read of things for you. The euro against the dollar, 108.34. Their currency pair negative here by 0.1%. Under surveillance this morning, counting down to the Fed rate decision at 2 p.m. Eastern time, investors looking to chair Jay Powell's news conference 30 minutes later for clues on the timeline for rate cuts. Traders pricing in a roughly 40% chance the central bank lowers rates at its next meeting in March. But most people we spoke to so far, Bramo, suggesting we won't get that guidance later on this afternoon. I mean, unless we do, unless in the press conference, he's like, all right, March it is, guys. I mean, at a certain point, the big surprise is going to come from the press conference because otherwise, when it comes to actually uh, the issue from the Federal Reserve, from the FOMC, it's going to be pretty vanilla, except for maybe taking out some of the hiking bias that they had previously. That's the Federal Reserve. Should we talk about a single name? Yes. Should we do Boeing? Yes. Yeah, not good when you see this headline, suspending forecasts for 2024, bright red across the Bloomberg terminal this morning. And the Boeing CEO, now is not the time to share financial objectives. It is a time to be reflecting on what's going on with their uh, 737 production and the safety and all that. Basically talking about the production rate uh, is now at five per month. But really, so many questions here, even with them beating fourth quarter uh, free cash flow and all of that. The suspension really is going to be what hangs in most people's minds. Fourth quarter revenue coming in at $22.02 billion, the estimate 21 point. Zero six. To Bramo's point, production numbers important. 737 production rate, 38 per month. 787 program production rate, now at five per month. If you're hoping for a ramp from here, Lisa, I think that's a difficult part of this. I think a lot of people hope that maybe they'd be able to ramp up production in the year to come based on the difficulties of the last few months. Maybe not likely. This is a really tough earnings call, and this is going to be an even tougher one for the regulators because a lot of airlines don't have a lot of choices. Are they going to wait for an Airbus for three years, or are they going to get a Boeing plane, albeit with some concerns around the edges? We heard from Ryanair saying, if you don't want your Max 737, we want them. Give them to us. The price is right. How many others are going to really follow suit regardless of what Boeing does? It's sort of built-in base of buyers. Let's get the stock price on the screen if we can. The headline crossing just moment ago suspending the forecast for 2024 as lisa said now is not the time to share financial objectives the message from dave calhoun that stock is positive by almost a half of one percent george ferguson senior aerospace defense and airline analyst at bloomberg intelligence joins us now for more george we're waiting for the numbers we've got them your first thoughts off the back of that yeah i mean i think this uh, uh you know this earnings uh call actually is the right way to um, say it, is really going to be all about the future. So we kind of knew what deliveries were. We had a decent understanding of what uh, revenues were going to be and profits. Uh, I haven't had a chance to dig through all of it. But again, I think the, the, the forward discussion from David Calhoun and the management team is going to be what's most important about this call. I think it's going to be, you know, does the FAA agree that 38 is the current rate for the, the max production? And if that's the case, and this FAA cap on their uh, manufacturing, you know, numbers is not going to affect them for at least six months. I would hope they could get pretty well through or not complete with the FAA review of their manufacturing by then. Uh, and then it wouldn't impact their, uh, you know, their deliveries for the year. And I think that, you know, largely would keep uh, the consensus view in, in place. Uh, but I think just the fact that they suspended guidance means that there's some concern about that. There's concern that's going to affect their, you know, their manufacturing cadence and they're not going to get all those deliveries out in 2024. Zooming out, can we just get a sense of how big a difference in profitability it would be for Boeing if their production rate were cut significantly? Their 737 production rate currently 38 per month. Let's say it goes down to 35. What would it go down to under a potential FAA cap and how much would that potentially hit their bottom line? So I don't think the FAA is talking about actually cutting from here. I think they're talking about, uh, you know, restrictions on letting Boeing increase from here. So I, I don't see them cutting it. I, I mean, an adjustment of 10 percent or so, like you mentioned, isn't going to affect uh, production. I think, you know, sorry, profitability dramatically. Uh, but I think the, the real, you know, sort of what we're all looking for from this company is to see production rates up in the 50s and 60s. We want to see them, you know, they, they need that increased rate to go through their supplier base 
because their supplier base has been working inefficiently because they're working at low rates, not making any money. That's stressing them financially. You know, their supplier base is out there hiring people, getting ready to ramp to higher rates. To pause that would put some financial stress on them. So this, you know, a, a slowdown in their ability to ramp up cascades through Boeing and the entire uh, base. So what we're really looking for is to minimize this cap, and, you know, have it be have it not be uh, an effect on their uh, on their break to higher rates. Meanwhile, the Boeing CEO, Dave Calhoun, saying increased scrutiny will make us better uh, in a memo to employees today. Also noting that the backlog for Boeing planes includes more than 5,600 commercial airplanes. Do the safety issues of Boeing really matter in terms of just the potential orders, given the fact that it's a duopoly, that it's between Boeing and Airbus, and they can't seem to develop the planes fast enough? So I think it matters less until you have these problems continue for so long, the customers start to look other places, especially core customers. So the fact that United is already talking to Airbus about A321s, is concerning. I would call, I wouldn't call them an anchor tenant in the Boeing, you know, backlog. They've got a lot in the Boeing backlog. Again, it's hard to go to Airbus and get in the queue for an A320 because I, I think you're waiting five or six years before you can get an airplane. Wow. So that keeps people coming to Boeing. Uh, but you know what we've heard from Bloomberg News even over the last couple of days is that Airbus has gone to some customers and asked them, "Hey, do you really need these airplanes in this in these years?" We're trying to free up some capacity to go conquest a customer, which is United. So that's somewhat concerning. If you start knocking away these big core customers like Southwest, Ryanair, Copa, Alaska, that fly just Boeing airplanes, then I'm even more concerned. So I'd say right now, hasn't happened. United, a little bit concerning if this continues and they start losing core customers, it'd be very concerning. Elisa, as you mentioned, certainly not what we're hearing from Ryanair. Ryanair have basically turned around and said, if you don't want your Boeings, we'll have them. Well, at a certain point. At the right, at the right price, at a good price. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> at a good price, because that's what Ryanair does. I mean, honestly, though, yeah. to me, at a certain point, though, you have to wonder if they are safe and if some of the hype has sort of been overblown. You just tighten the screws, put, make sure to put them in, and you're going to be OK. Why not actually see people picking these up on the other side? I don't know. I mean, honestly, are others going to do the same thing, John? George, Lisa has talked about this. Brooks Sutherland has as well. It's something we should build on. The culture of Boeing, led by Dave Calhoun, Dave is saying all the right things over the last few weeks. There was that very passionate address to employees that we saw a few weeks ago. George, what's going on with the culture inside of the company? As our friend Tom Keane would say, what changed at Boeing? What happened? So I think it's very concerning, right? The culture used to be, I think, one of a very good engineering firm. I think that the playbook that they used prior to the pandemic doesn't work anymore. And that playbook may have been of, of less oversight and less training because they had very seasoned people on the line. The pandemic, and, and frankly, probably the max grounding prior to that, has led to a large change in their workforce. And, and Dave Calhoun's going to have to put his money where his mouth is and get and get you know spend more money on supervision and training on these production lines go out and cooperate with the suppliers, make sure they're in financial health, make sure they're training, make sure they're supervising so he can ensure the product that he delivers is a quality product. And that's when we're gonna know, it's great to go out and talk to everybody and tell them how much you care, but then you gotta put your money where your mouth is, spend that, it means the margins aren't gonna look as good, cash flow might not be as good, while well, you reconstitute the core of this company. Boeing said that it's pausing 737 production for one day to refocus on quality. Is that sufficient? I mean, one day is not going to make a difference. Again, this is all about spending the money over the long run to train people well and to supervise those lines. You can't count on really seasoned workers anymore. They've left. George, conference call a little bit later today. Questions for the leadership at Boeing. What are they right now? Yeah, I mean, I'd want to know what they're doing about improving that supervision of both them and their suppliers, right? They need to get down. We, we're probably going to find out that this problem didn't even happen to Spirit, but we knew there were other problems that happened to Spirit. And we've watched problems that Spirit's had with their suppliers affect the ability to deliver a quality 737. You know, we're going to want to know how he's going to get down there and, and supervise, manage, oversee all those suppliers. And we're going to want to know what he's doing on his lines, again, to make sure he's got good supervision and good training. 
Hey, George, thank you. We have to leave it there. George Ferguson there of Bloomberg Intelligence. Boeing in a hot spot right now, under the spotlight. Really, really tough times for that company. Here's the latest then. The numbers, the forecast, there isn't one. They've suspended their forecast for 2024. Fourth quarter revenue, hardly talked about it. It's OK. 22.02 billion, the estimate 21.06. The production rate for two planes, pausing the 737 production for one day to refocus on quality. The production rate at 38 per month. For the 787, the programme production rate is now at five per month. Based on what you've heard this morning so far, Lisa, questions on the call? The conference call with Dave Calhoun later. Uh, do you think that one day is sufficient to refocus on quality? What kind of message does that send? And then also, you know, what do you think you personally got wrong that you personally would like to change, considering that this has been an ongoing issue? That stock is positive by zero. 0.7% in the pre-market. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. We can do that with your Bloomberg brief. Here's Yahira Hakez. Hey, Yahira. Hi, John. Donald Trump has expanded his lead over President Biden in key swing states ahead of November's presidential election. The latest Bloomberg Morning Consult poll shows Trump leading in all seven battleground states. The poll does show more than half of voters in those swing states wouldn't vote for Trump if he were convicted of a crime. Shares in, of Saudi Aramco fell as much as 2.2% in Riyadh on news of a revival of a follow-on offering as soon as next month. Bloomberg reports the kingdom is working with a group of advisors to raise at least $10 billion from the share sale. This comes after Saudi Arabia raised $30 billion in its Aramco IPO four years ago, which was the world's largest stock sale. Nova Nordisk became the second ever European company to pass half a billion dollars in market value. The Danish drug maker expects a 26% jump in revenue and 29% increase in operating profits due to demand for its Wagovi and Azempic obesity and diabetes medicines. Novo CEO says the company is well positioned to grow its patient base. We have access to some 50 million patients in the US and we are only serving a small fraction of that. So there's ample opportunity for competition, and this is really about uh, growing the market, serving more patients, than uh, it's a matter of, of market share. And that's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahira, thank you. Up next on this program, investors betting big on AI. AI, AI, AI. Can't say it enough. Productivity is going to be one of the keys to growth, and these are companies that are best in their industry. They've got the financial metrics, um, but again, they're pushing up against valuations. That conversation coming up very shortly, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Equity's pulling back just a touch. This is Bloomberg. He's pulling back on the S&P 500 by 0.5%. A bit of weakness out there in equities. Yields just about unchanged on a 10-year 4.0279%. Under surveillance this morning, investors betting big on one thing. AI, AI, AI. Can't say it enough. Productivity is going to be one of the keys to growth. And these are companies that are best in their industry. You look at earnings growth and flat the new up. Uh, tech earnings are, uh, are, you know, revisions are up modestly while the rest of the S&P 500 is decelerating. So this is a big test this week. Here's the latest this morning. Microsoft and Google falling in the pre-market after struggling to meet AI-fueled expectations tomorrow. Tech earnings resume with Apple, Meta and Amazon. BlackRock's Wai Lee saying this. Excitement over AI spurred a rally in U.S. tech stocks that buoyed the market in 2023. We upgrade broad U.S. stocks to overweight on a tactical horizon of 6 to 12 months. Wai Lee, I'm pleased to say, joins us now for more. So Wai Lee, a little bit more constructive on equities in the United States. Is that all AI? Or is it other things as well? Well, up until now, it has been all AI. And I say that both about market performance, but also about our investment view. So up until now, our overweight in AI have been offset by our underweight to broad equity market in the U.S. And then if we look at performance, you know, you look at equal weighted uh, 
U.S. equity market S&P, it was up 5% the last 12 months. And if you look at Nasdaq, it was up 50%. So very concentrated market, warranting a concentrated approach up until now. But now we actually think that that rally can broaden out, not specifically about AI. There is a, a piece about the application of AI, of course, but more broadly about the fact that, well, uh, this week is the Fed meeting, but the big meeting of uh, the Fed took place in December, where they essentially green light equities and risk assets to embrace the immaculate disinflation narrative. And we think that that momentum can run because inflation is falling first before it then starts to rebound later uh, uh, this year and uh, beginning of next year. So when that is the backdrop, this immaculate dis uh, disinflation narrative can support broad equity uh, momentum, which is why we uh, upgraded uh, U.S. equity markets to uh, not just be all about the AI piece, but uh, uh, the broad markets uh, as well as we consider AI. Well, you tease some of it out. What's interesting about your call is this tactical call in the short term, six to 12 months, and where you see things going further out with inflation picking up again. Could you walk us through your thoughts around that? You seem to believe there's this window open at the moment to engage with the market in a more constructive way, but further down the road, we're going to have some problems. Where do those problems come from? Yeah, so when I was in Davos, I took away this concept of uh, uh, normalization, a new normal, which is something that Christine Lagarde was talking about as economies come out of the uh, crisis. So normalization is the journey a new normal is the destination. But because markets can only focus on one thing at a time, right now it's focusing on the journey, and the journey is not a bad journey. It's a journey where inflation falls down to 2%. is a journey where policy rates starts to go down. But where problems can come from further down the line, I'm talking about later this year, beginning of next year, and maybe even further down the line, is when goods deflation stop bringing down inflation and persistent wage start pushing up inflation. So we actually expect inflation to fall all the way to target uh, of 2%, but settle around three. So this roller coaster of a, of a journey is something that markets are currently not focusing on because you can only focus on one thing at a time. But later this year, that roller coaster pattern is going to come into view as tight labor market continue to kind of leads to uh, a, a tight and, and persistent wage pressure. And when that happens, I think there will be a more uh, a fundamental reset. But for now, momentum can run, especially also boosted by reasonable earnings growth. So, you know, we still have the AI uh, preference and Magnificent 7 is expected to grow their earnings by 21% this year, a third of the index level. And tech-related themes are carrying more than 50% of the index earnings growth this year. So we still like that, but with the momentum and this uh, 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 immaculate disinflation narrative supporting broad market, it could uh, also support a bit of a broadening out of the rally that we have seen so far that has been so concentrated up until now. So, uh, so much to unpack. I want to talk more about the journey and the destination, the journey that looks good and a destination uh, that looks a little bit more inflationary. Where does that leave credit at a time where people have been piling to top rated credit at an accelerating pace? You've seen spreads come in to the tightest in a couple of years. You've seen companies come out and just absolutely flood the market with supply. Does it feel like that area, especially in the face of resurgent inflation, looks a little more dicey at this point? Well, we actually prefer duration over credit at this point, precisely because of the valuation and, and tight spreads uh, that you uh, that point that you just uh, that you just made. Uh, we think that uh, spread can widen out incrementally a little bit, maybe twenty basis point, maybe fifty basis point, one for IG, one for high yield in the inflation roller coaster type of uh, a scenario, which is our uh, base case. But you know, um, currently. The narrative is not a bad one because the focus is on the journey. So whilst we don't love credit, we're not expecting spread to blow out in a, a risk of type of uh, type of environment. We just think that uh, duration looks more attractive than credit. And also, frankly, if you want to take more risk, equity, uh, equities look more 
attractive uh, as well. So a bit of a barbell in thinking about duration and equity, given how tight credit is. But uh, we think that spread can widen out, but it's nowhere close to the, the, the episodes that we experienced during global financial crisis, uh, even as refinancing war comes into view, because we're still talking about a controlled, contained environment where cost of funding increases, but not uh, blowing out. So um, just on a valuation basis, not as attractive, uh, which is why we don't love it, but we're not forecasting terrible things to happen to credit either. When we talk about a 3% inflation destination, what does that do just generally for a mix of a portfolio? Does that mean that equities will have a better place just going forward than the traditional 60-40? Um, a 3% inflation uh, environment is not a terrible environment, especially also in the context of earnings always uh, being quoted in nominal, right? So a bit of inflation, not too much, not inflation runaway. I think that can be constructive for equity. Maybe the reset to this new environment can be volatile. But once we get there, it doesn't have to be negative uh, for uh, doesn't have to be negative for equities. On a related note, as inflation stabilizes around 3% instead of uh, 2%, I think we're also looking at a higher neutral rate as well, which in our assessment is uh, about uh, 1% higher than pre-pandemic levels. And when we look at that kind of environment, back to your earlier point about credit, private credit looks quite uh, uh, quite attractive. You look at the relative yield pickup, 650 basis point above uh, the, the, the public uh, equivalent and uh, investors wanting to lock in and turn out uh, uh, some of the uh, allocations. So private credit infrastructure, those type of uh, uh, exposures looks quite interesting in this uh, in this context. Wait, before you go, Chairman Powell, a little bit later today, no change expected in the statement in terms of the actual decision. What are you looking for from the chairman of the news conference? Um, well, uh, the big meeting uh, is actually the December meeting. Um, we are paying attention at uh, um, this particular uh, juncture if uh, he would push back against still quite uh, aggressive expectations for rate cuts. So we think that rates will be cut this year, but maybe three instead of the five, six that markets are hoping for. So we're looking for if he would push back. But given right now the prevalent backdrop is still inflation falling because goods deflation is very, very powerful. If markets get nervous, from the pushback, if at all we get that later today, that would be a moment for us to maybe even lean into uh, the, 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 the risk uh, environment a bit more because the prevalent narrative for now, next six months and beyond is falling inflation. So uh, if they push back, we would uh, want to be uh, more constructive and lean into that. Wei Li of BlackRock. Wei, thank you. Always good to hear from you. Much more constructive on the US equity market. Bear in mind, though, this is a tactical call, six to 12 months, and then they expect inflation to pick up again, Lisa. We heard a little bit of this, or the possibility from Bruce Kasman over at JP Morgan when he's talking about once the good disinflation kind of works its way through the year over year comparison figures, you start to look at the strength and you start to wonder if we do see a little bit more lift in prices to this 3% world that Wei was talking about. Will Chairman Powell push back when he seemed to lean in? in that December meeting? You know, right now it doesn't seem like they have any incentive to really push back against this because inflation has kept coming in. I'm really curious to see, frankly, the jobs numbers on Friday and how much wage inflation's come in. To yep. me, that's going to be maybe even more important than what the Fed talks about today. The 2 p.m. Eastern time for the decision. 30 minutes after that, the news conference, then on to Friday for payrolls Friday. Tons of economic data in between as well. Let's check out shares of Boeing just briefly. Boeing in the pre-market is positive. Firmer by, let's call it 0.5%. The numbers weren't terrible for the fourth quarter, but you don't get an outlook. Suspending the forecast for 2024. Lisa, now is the time not to share financial guidance. No, we will simply focus on every next airplane while doing everything possible to support our customers, follow the lead of our regulator, and ensure the highest standard of safety and quality in all that we do. That is going to be the appetizer to whatever we get in the earnings call later today. I imagine this is going to be a difficult call a little bit later. There's going to be none of that great quarter, great quarter stuff. It's going to be some serious questions about how they plan to avoid this happening ever again. It's going to be a very, very different tone. Coming up in the next hour, the third hour of Bloomberg surveillance is shaping up as follows. Michael Schall of Marketfield Asset Management, former Federal Reserve economist Claudia Sam, and Ira Jersey of Bloomberg Intelligence. All of that and a whole lot more in the next hour. From New York City this morning, good morning. Equities pulling back as tech disappoints very, very high expectations. This 
It's Bloomberg TV. I think it's a very, very tight rope that the Fed is walking. What we expect him to do is to lay the ground for why a March rate cut makes sense. I still don't think they're actually going to be cutting in March. They're not really in a rush. March just seems a little premature. I yeah. think 50-50 is a good probability. Do they go in March? Probably not, but they likely ease at some point in the second quarter to try to get ahead of any weakness. I think the Fed's in a really tricky spot. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. It is Fed Decision Day, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Lisa Abramowitz, together with Anne-Marie Horton. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market trying to bounce. We're negative by 0.4% on the S&P 500. Later today, Chairman Powell, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, looking for clues of a March rate cut. Yeah, well, whether we get one or not, we shall see. The press conference might be fiery or might not be. Here's a question that I have. At a certain point, they're looking at their core PCE deflator that they typically look at, their key inflation metric, being below 2% on a six-month annualized basis. Are they going to hold that up and say, we've got it. We've got that 2% inflation. We've got a green light to go. New York Fed President John Williams, in the hours after Chairman Powell delivered the news conference in the middle of December, we aren't really talking about rate cuts. Do you think they're talking about rate cuts at this meeting? 100%. If they say that they're not talking about rate cuts or try to back away from that, people will laugh. I mean, that's just not possible because everybody is expecting them to probably remove some of the hiking bias from their language. Key question to me is, what is the metric? What is the key determining feature for them to pull the trigger and actually cut? Democratic colleagues down in Washington, D.C. I doubt. <laughs> would like them to cut rates right now. Senator Warren and three Democratic colleagues together now with Senate Banking Committee Sherrod Brown in a letter to Chairman Powell. Two separate letters, yep. Anne-Marie, saying let's go. Let's cut interest rates. Sherrod Brown right here, quote, while more must be done to address the fact that costs remain too high, it is becoming increasingly evident that restrictive monetary policy is no longer the right tool. So they're edging on Powell to cut. To Jonathan, to your point, they know he's going to cut at some point. So why are they almost goading the Republicans to come out and make this an election it's issue? It's bizarre. You've mentioned it a few times that the calendar might be on the president's side as the economic data continues to be OK, consumer confidence starts to turn around, that perhaps on the economic side of things, things improve. Then we introduce a new topic, immigration. Our latest poll here at Bloomberg with Morning Consult, just not great for the president whatsoever. The economy is one issue, immigration another one altogether. What we found in this poll is that actually on a top issue, economy still remains number one, but more people are starting to say actually immigration is number one. So if more people are feeling better about the economy, then what's the next issue that they care about? That's immigration. 65 and over, those swing state voters, it's a tie between the economy and immigration. When it comes to immigration, the president gets poor remarks. All seven swing states, Bramo, the president behind the former president, Donald Trump. I mean, we heard that from Greg Valliere, that if the election were held right now, Trump would win. And this seems to be something that's uh, not necessarily on the front burner yet, because we have, what, nine months of an election season, a general election that's going to be the longest ever in history. In history. So we have a long way to go and uh, a lot can happen. But it's interesting to sort of gauge where people are, where people's minds are at. It feels like we're a year in already, doesn't it? Another sort of nine, ten months to go. Exciting stuff. I mean, I just wonder how much this is going to evolve. You know, you were talking about this earlier. How many debates are we going to see? Probably not that many. I don't think we will Maybe see any. Maybe zero. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's a good chance, Amory, we won't get one. Yeah, there's a chance that neither of these men show up for a debate. So how does the narrative change from now until then? It's going to be really economic and it's going to be uh, event driven with other potential geopolitical issues. Absolutely. But when you come back to the economy, I'm so keen to learn about what the unemployment rate is going to be Friday, because if it's under 4 percent, that's two years exactly of under 4 percent unemployment rate. And this is something the Biden administration is going to take to those swing state voters and say they're delivering on economic rebound. The estimate right now, if you want a sneak peek of our survey, 3.8 percent is the estimate just up from the previous reading. 3.7 payrolls 216 last time around the estimate Bramo 185 185 is still okay the focus I think for the bears and some of the economists looking beneath the surface is just the breadth 
of those payrolls gains really started to narrow, just a few industry groups driving things at the top level. Construction, for example, I mean, we've seen very specific drivers of that. I'm also watching wages. How much are wages continuing to accelerate or decelerate, as so many people expect? Let's turn to the price action for you this morning. The stage set as follows going into the open and bell in about 85 minutes' time. Equity futures look like this. We're down by 0.4%. Yields are going nowhere on a 10-year 4.0298%. Phenomenal just to see crude lower again by 1.3%, $76.79 on WTI. Coming up this hour, Michael Schaul of Market Field Asset Management on the Fed's path forward, Bloomberg's Michael McKee breaking US ADP data and the Treasury refunding announcement through the next hour, and former Federal Reserve economist Claudia Sam on why she thinks the Fed should cut sooner rather than than later. We begin with our top story, counting down to the Fed rate decision. Michael Schall of Marketfield Asset Management saying December's data shows, quote, considerable progress made in the fight against inflation, but it also contains warnings about the potential for a bottoming of the Fed's preferred inflation gauge, PCE deflator, early this year. Michael, I'm pleased to say, joins us around the table. So, Michael, let's start with Chairman Powell. What are you looking for in the news conference later? You know, I think he'll try and keep his options open. I mean, this is not a live meeting as far as actually cutting rates is concerned. The Fed's under no pressure to cut rates. Um, it is under pressure to make a big decision in March, and I think he'll do his best to keep his, you know, keep his options open and talk both sides of his book. It's a big decision. Is it an easy one, based on what we've seen in inflation recently? I don't think they need to cut rates, but they've kind of talked themselves into the position that the market has put a lot of pressure on, on, on to, to cut rates. I mean, I really feel that that December meeting, they moved a lot further than they had to. Uh, you know, in November, they were still talking about financial conditions being tightened by, you know, the 10 year yields at 5%, comes into December with 10 year yields at 4%, and he's like, you know, <laughs> he's like, who cares about financial conditions? So, I, I, you know, I, I think the Fed have created something of a rod for its back. You could say it another way. The Fed feels that it's winning the fight and uh, it doesn't quite want to say it's won, but it wants to hint that it's winning. Um, but yeah, they're under some pressure. But Michael, does it matter? I mean, I know that you're one of those people who is concerned about inflation reaccelerating later this year. Is that a concern regardless of what the Fed does? I don't think a 25 basis point cut in March really makes any difference to the underlying economy, but it does... You know, if you're worried about asset inflation, um, I think it does encourage a little bit more speculation. Um, and, uh, you know, what they don't want to be is a yo-yo fe Fed. They don't want to be a Fed that cuts and hikes and, and hikes and cuts. They, they, they really want to be a Fed which is ahead of an economic cycle, which is taking interest rates down when they have to, keeping them where they should be when they have to. It, it, look, it's an almost impossible task. But, um, you know, they certainly don't want to be a yo-yo. When you talk about asset price inflation, I wonder if there's a lesson from the recent earnings that we got from uh, Google and Microsoft yesterday. Is this asset price inflation or is this fundamental hopes and dreams that are either borne out or not uh, by the actual earnings? Well, I think they're both the same thing, right? I mean, one's hopes are inflated by you know, things like, things like interest rates. In other words, you know, the market has a chance to look at good news and bad news, and sometimes it really emphasizes the good, and sometimes it really emphasizes the bad. And there's no doubt that, that in the fourth quarter last year, you really dialed up the enthusiasm level. And, and you see it in, in metrics such as, such as consumer confidence. I mean, to us, consumer confidence is, is an extension of belief in the equity market as much as belief in the underlying economy. Um, and you could see that consumers never really embraced this incredible bull market since COVID, didn't really get nervous in 2022, but it took until November, December of 2023 for that enthusiasm level to really be turned up again. Consumers are feeling better, but when you think about how Alan Greenspan used to think of price stability, it was inflation so low mm -hmm. that prices would not impact daily decisions of everyday Americans. I'm not seeing that in polls or stories I'm reading about how people feel about the economy. Well, I, I think people got a big shock in 2021, 22. And although the inflation numbers feel better, people don't really feel better because you sort of remember what things cost 
three, four years ago. And although they're not going up in price in 2024 very quickly, they are a lot more expensive than they were in recent memory. And so, you know, the aftershock of, of the big hike in prices in COVID, you know, still remains. It's only gasoline, which is kind of back to where people would expect it to be. We've said it so many times, the cumulative inflation since 2020. The scars are still running deep. Let's talk about the stock market and get some of your thoughts on things. Framing matters, according to Sebastian Page at T. Rowe Price, he joined us in the previous hour. He said stocks up 2% in the last two years sounds cheap. Markets at all-time highs sounds expensive. How would you frame things in the stock market now? Well, I mean, I, I, I think it's, you know, again, being a, you know, it's technology and everything else. I, I, I don't think tech looks cheap and it's not up 2%. Um, you know, we didn't have $3 billion, sorry, $3 trillion companies two years ago. And, and, we, and we do today. And the concentration of ownership in that portion of the market is much higher than it was two years ago. But yeah, S&P equal weight or a, a lot of the Cyclical stuff in the S&P is, is not expensive and, and this so far has been a pretty good earnings season for sort of general economic activity. Michael Shaw, going to stick with us, I'm pleased to say. Michael Shaw there of Market Field Asset Management. Some of those tech names this morning, very lofty expectations just coming short. Those stocks pulling back in the pre-market. Equity futures negative by 0.4% on the S&P 500. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with your Hira Hackers. Hey, Yahira. Hi, John. Boeing has suspended financial guidance for 2024 as it signals to investors a renewed focus on safety. The aircraft maker's earnings report took a back seat to Boeing's latest 737 MAX crisis, where a near catastrophic panel blowout on an Alaska Airlines flight triggered groundings and the FAA to step up scrutiny of the company. Fourth quarter profit and cash flow surpassed analyst estimates. Shares in Saudi Aramco fell as much as 2.2% in Riyadh on news of a revival of a follow-on offering as soon as next month. Bloomberg reports the kingdom is working with a group of advisors to raise at least $10 billion from the sale. This comes after Saudi Arabia raised $30 billion in its Aramco IPO four years ago, which was the world's largest stock sale. Media mogul Byron Allen has made a $14.3 billion offer for all of Paramount's outstanding shares. Allen is offering to pay a 50% premium to recent trading, according to people familiar with his terms. The total value of the deal, including existing debt, tops about $30 billion. In a statement to Bloomberg News, Allen Media Group says this offer, quote, is the best solution for all of the Paramount Global shareholders, and the bid should be taken seriously and pursued. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahara, thank you. Coming up next on this program, it's the appetizer to Friday's payrolls report. How much cooling do we need to see in the labor market? And can we continue to destroy job openings without destroying jobs? If we can do that, then the path to 2% without a recession should be relatively smooth. Live from New York City, the ADP report is coming up next. Michael McKee is going to break that down ahead of Payrolls Friday. Equity futures on the S&P 500 trying to bounce here, negative by 0.4% into the bond market. Your 10-year yield in America basically unchanged going into the Fed a little bit later this afternoon. going to do this. It's a monthly event. It's something we say we don't care about. <laughs> then depending on what the number looks like, the market decides it cares about it. Equity futures going into the ADP report look like this on the S&P 500, negative by 0.4%. Tech earnings disappoint. Lofty expectations. We're down 0.9% on the Nasdaq. With the ADP report, here's Mike McKee. Morning, Mike. Good morning, John. Well, it's a disappointing ADP report if you're looking for a big month of hiring. Only 107,000 jobs, according to ADP. That is significantly lower than the 151,000 that economists thought ADP would find. Most of the employment is in the service providing sector, 77,000 of the jobs there, 30,000 in goods producing. 2,000 of those in manufacturing. Most of that is uh, in construction, 22,000 there. So uh, it looks like a uh, 
the, the categories of jobs that have been looking for uh, help have uh, been the ones that basically absorb the new workers. Small establishments, 25,000 jobs, non-farm, uh, or medium rather, 61,000, and large establishments, 31,000. In terms of their pay numbers, uh, job stayers got a 5.2% increase, job changers 7.2%. So we're still ahead of inflation in terms of pay, but we are definitely not getting the kind of jobs that a lot of people think we're going to get for the payrolls report on Friday. Not a lot of drama in markets as they parse through that. We'll bring that to you in a second. But I am curious, as you dig underneath this, what your takeaway is for Friday for non-farm payrolls. I feel like we are on a broken record. We ask you this literally every time ADP comes out. What predictive features does ADP have for non-farm pay- payrolls? It doesn't really have much of a predictive factor. Now, remember, ADP is only private payrolls, doesn't include government, so the number is not going to match the headline payroll number. But the problem with ADP is its methodology is different than the government's, and so it uh, they go out of their way to say we're not a predictor. The problem for the markets this time is some of the numbers that normally go into the calculation of what people think we'll get on Friday have not been released yet because because of the calendar, like the ISM numbers uh, in terms of employment for service providing and manufacturing, we've had uh, pretty much only the, uh, the, the uh, jobless rate numbers. And so um, this may affect people's thinking. But uh, given the big jump in the jobs uh, plentiful to get uh, yesterday in the conference board, um, I think most people are leaning towards a stronger job number Friday than they are uh, looking at something like ADP found. And Mike, before you go, 8.30, Treasury refunding. What are you focused on, given what we've already heard in the last 48 hours or so? Well, uh, the, yeah, the, the decline in the amount that the Treasury has to borrow has markets backing off a little bit from the idea of a major move on these uh, data that come out at 8.30. But basically, they're looking to see if Treasury is indeed increasing the auction size, as they said they would last time, and whether or not there are going to be any buybacks announced. Treasury said they're going to start buying off-the-run treasuries. The question is, uh, when do they start doing that? Uh, and then the mix of bills and notes and bonds is going to be important to the markets, whether the uh, Treasury is still going to rely heavily on bills to make up much of their funding. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Catch up with you in about 12 minutes' time. Let's go back through that data, 107. The ADP report coming in at 107,000, the estimate 150 going into payrolls tomorrow, or rather on Friday, 185 is the estimate in our survey for Friday, for Friday payrolls, the previous number 216. So downside surprise on ADP, here's the reaction to it, slightly lower on the equity market. We were there already in the equity market on the S&P 500, negative by 0.4, on the Nasdaq down by about 0.9. What you do see a very subtle move is at the front end of the yield curve, the two-year yield came in just a little bit. The two-year right now is down about three basis points, 4.30.56, down a single basis basis point on a 10-year maturity to 4.0184%. We'll be talking about Treasuries a whole lot more in about 11 minutes' time. Just to finish on foreign exchange, just a touch of dollar weakness, and I mean just a touch. The euro positive on the session by about 0.01% for a heartbeat. Bramo, 108.45% on the euro. It's the smallest of downside surprises in the grand scheme of things. Especially given the fact that EDP is not necessarily a predictive feature. And what we heard from Mike there was 5% for job stayers in terms of wages increasing and 7% for job switchers. It's not exactly getting back to uh, some sort of level of wage inflation that could give the Fed true comfort. So it's not really going to move the needle. Michael Schaud of Marketfield Asset Management still with us around the table for some final thoughts. Michael, let's talk about the economic data. Mm -hmm. How much is payrolls Friday going to move the needle for you? Um, you know, I think if it's anywhere between 150 and 200, it's not going to, it's not going to really matter. There'll be a, a little bit of excitement around it. Look, I, I, I think that, that you may get something big in the household survey. Last, last month, we had this, like, very weak number of people employed in the household survey coupled with a uh, weak participation rate. I, I think maybe we get the opposite this time because that survey does bob around. Maybe we get more people being added to the labor force in the household survey and a, and a better participation rate. So we still don't move you three that much. Look, I, I think the labor market is, is basically chugging along. It's tight. 
Uh, we're not adding a lot of new jobs. Um, I do think, as you said, people are going to be looking at the different sectors. You know, the JOLTS report suggests that openings are sort of broadening in some of the sectors which haven't created any new jobs. But, but what nothing is showing, or no piece of data is showing, any significant layoffs in the core economic sectors of the economy. So we sort of remain in a, in a full employment environment with plenty of wage gains running ahead of inflation. It's not a wage price spiral, but it's in no way weak. Lisa raised this question a little bit earlier this morning, just how relevant is the JOLTS report? Job openings yesterday, the quits rate still quite elevated. How relevant is that? Um, you know, I, I think it's a reminder that things really aren't getting worse. I mean, I say what we see, we can have a, a long argument about how strong the economy is, but you could have a very short argument about how weak it is. But there's really nothing out there that suggests this economy is pre-recession. So how much are you contrarian at this point, given the fact that everyone kind of has coalesced around that view? It's a strong economy. Things are going to go well. The Fed's going to cut rates. That's basically baked into valuations. Where do you push back? Yeah, I think the risk of a meaningful acceleration is much higher than the market, and, and most people do. I, I think what we've been through is, is an economy which was distorted by COVID, and then we remove that distortion, which looks like the beginnings of economic weakening. I think all of that transitory weakening is now falling out of the data pretty fast, and we're going to find the, the, the sort of core economy, the non-COVID distorted economy, is running hotter than people expect. Which, which raises this question about when we're going to see this in the data. Right. I mean, I think about what Wei Lee was talking about, where it's the journey feels pretty good, the destination looks a little different. What's the pivot point? What are you looking for? Yeah, I think the ISM getting back above 50 would be a sign that this destocking cycle has run its course. I think that would be the beginning of a change. I think that would feed through to all the, all the durable goods deflation, which is really what's pulled PCE down, falling out of the data. Um, and if service sector inflation sort of remains between that 3 and 4% level across the board, which is really what we're seeing, then mathematically core PC and core CPI are going to be very sticky, you know, very sticky in the high, high twos and low threes. On the flip side, in Europe, you do see the disinflation and you do see the weakness as well. German uh, CPI came out just a bit ago, 3.1% versus the estimate of 3.2%. Are you leaning into Europe and away from the U.S. because of that, or do you say the U.S. is really the only game in town? Um, I don't think Europe's giving you any obvious reasons to be there. I mean, Japan's the really exciting global market. I mean, that, that, you know, the Nikkei, since I was a kid, the idea of the Nikkei at 38 or 39,000 was like this sort of mythological target. And, you know, I think I'm going to see it before retirement now. Are you looking for a hike from the BOJ anytime soon? I think they're going to be very, very, very patient. I, I think do we Japanese need a hike have... to make that Japanese equity trade work? The rally we've seen in the banks, the hopes that interest rates and that regime is going to end. Uh, I, I think the banks probably do, but again, the core, you know, it looks like Japan is having a bit of a consumption-led cycle for the first time in, in, in many, many decades. And you talk about a country in which consumer sentiment has been lousy for, I mean, the majority of people's lives. You know, that might actually be changing over there. What else is working outside of US tech and Japanese equities? What I mean, else is working? The, the S&P equal weights. Not bad. It's not far off its all-time high. It, you know, so this has been more than a tech-driven rally. It's just tech has sort of over-rallied versus, versus the rest of the equity market. I mean, you do see there are some industrial stocks at all-time highs. Um, you know, there's even portions of energy at, at, at all-time highs. So, you know, you can look around, and the global equity market has plenty of individual names. But, but you know, if you're looking for sort of institutional and retail flows into an index, the S&P and the Nasdaq still dominate everything else. And until that changes, I think the returns will show the same thing. Michael, thank you, sir. It's good to see you, as thank always. You. Michael Shaw there of Marketfield Asset Management. Just to touch base with a pre-market price action across those three names that reported after the bout yesterday, the likes of Microsoft, Alphabet and AMD. This is where we are right now. Microsoft numbers were decent. They were strong. We're down only 0.2%. Alphabet is where the question mark is. We're down a little more than 5%. I think people easily spooked around the search business, Lisa, given the potential threat that's coming from elsewhere and AI. I think that's well said. Everyone's been talking about the sort of Google search and the disappointment for ad revenue. Let's put a number on that. It was $48 billion. That was the revenue in Alphabet's core search business. It missed the projections by the, the entirety, $48.15 billion. This wasn't exactly this massive miss. It's just a matter of expectations being very elevated. Doesn't take much to spook people exactly. around Google search at the moment, the threat of Bing and AI and... I, I, Chat GPT. I, I buy into it. I know you don't, but I, I, I think. The, I think that. Well, I mean, 
let's be honest, I don't like bing a lot, but occasionally I'll try to see if, you know. Make it sound like a bad habit. <laughs> You know? <laughs> I just like to check out the like AI fused Bing. Okay. Coming up next on the program, the quarterly Treasury refunding announcement mm -hmm. and the market reaction with Bloomberg's Michael McKee and Ira Jersey. That's up next from New York. This is Bloomberg. Sixty minutes away from the opening bell, your stock market looks like this. It's pulling back a little bit on the S&P 500. We'll talk about tech earnings in a moment. Down 0.4% on the S&P on the Nasdaq, down by 0.9. Small caps doing OK on a Russell, up by 0.3. Lots to talk about in the bond market. Mike McKee and Ira Jersey are going to break this down for you in a few minutes' time when we get more details on the Treasury refunding announcement. That's going to come out in just the next couple of seconds. We'll give Mike McKee some time to chew over it. Yields are lower by two basis points. Call it three on a 10-year. That's a break of 4%, 399 on a two-year, down about 6, 428 on a two-year yield. If you're looking at the FX market, the euro... Looks like this, the euro against the dollar, 108.45, totally unchanged. Some inflation data, Bramo, out of the eurozone a little bit earlier. Does that move the dial for you in any way, shape or form? It's basically uh, pretty consistent with both France and Germany coming in below expectations. CPI in Germany coming in at 3.2% versus the expected 3.3%, uh, 3.4%. Honestly, the disinflation trend is strong there and they have the weakness that the U.S. doesn't have. So, you know, all the prognostications, could the ECB cut rates even before the Fed? The euro going absolutely nowhere. I promise you that update on tech under surveillance this morning. Mega cap tech disappointing, very high expectations. Microsoft reporting revenue growth at its fastest pace since 2022. Yet investors still wanted clarity on the future growth from AI. Google reporting weakness in its core search business, raising concerns as to how much it could continue to keep up with AI competition. Amazon, Apple, Meta, all on deck, all reporting after the bell tomorrow. Apple over the last year up 30%, Amazon up 54 Meta up 168% over the last one year. I would argue Thursday, tomorrow is going to be more interesting for some of these tech earnings, especially with questions around Amazon losing cloud share to Microsoft. And then also this question around Apple and the hardware of it. Are we really getting bored of our phones? Are people not necessarily upgrading? Is this what we're going to hear? What about China? How about uh, some of the uh, questions around a number of the antitrust issues? These are some of the things that I think are going to make for a more interesting reading. The headwinds in China are fascinating because there's some Chinese policy about having foreign tech in some certain workplaces and we have seen some issues there when it comes to the iPhone and this analyst last night puts out this report about the semiconductor components and what this analyst says it shows is that shipments of the iPhone upcoming iPhone 16 will decline 10 to 15 percent in China. We haven't talked about this yet. Let's turn to another story. A Delaware judge striking a blow to Elon Musk's fortune. The Tesla co-founder's 2018 $55 billion package voided by a Delaware judge after a shareholder challenged it as excessive. Musk reacting on, guess what, X, formerly known as Twitter, <laughs> writing, quote, never incorporate your company in Delaware. I recommend incorporating in Nevada or Texas if you prefer shareholders to decide matters. Lisa, your thoughts? Um, I go back to what I said before. I think that Elon Musk is realizing it's a lot more fun to run a tech company than it is to run a car company. And it's a lot more fun to run something that's private than public, because right now when it's public, he's not very happy with some of the scrutiny that is uh, entailed. That's all I can say about this, because honestly, at a certain point, he wants 25 percent of the company. He wants to change into a tech company. It's a car company and people are buying cars. Where is his stewardship of that? Well, when it also comes to ditching Delaware, more than 70 percent of Fortune 500 companies are in Delaware. They're incorporated there for a reason, given their unique laws, given their unique uh, how they deal with uh, tax policy in those courts. I don't think he's actually leaving there anytime soon, but he did say to his ex followers that they should weigh in. So maybe he will actually go incorporate to Texas if his, uh, you know, followers say that's move what's going to guide I things. Mean, that's what he yeah. was saying. Yeah, exactly. Vote here. Ninety percent are like, yeah, you should move. I mean, is this all just basically? I mean, it just seems like a little bit high school. It's like vote. High you, school. It feels. You know what I'm saying? It's sort of over like 50, 60 billion dollar pay packages. <laughs> Slight <laughs> difference. Like, who's most popular? <laughs> well, that, it's just sort of like respond to me, like this video, you know, like whatever the it's your buy sports expression team. is. You think so? Just buy a sports. No, Take a page from somebody else who we AC, know. AC Milan. David Rubenstein, not buying AC Milan. I was about Milan. to say, do you want him to buy AC not Milan? Buying. 
If he's got the money and he's willing to spend it on players, absolutely. I'll take anyone right now. <laughs> David Rubenstein, the Carlisle Group co-founder, leading a consortium of investors in a deal to buy Major League Baseball Baltimore Orioles for $1.7 billion. The group agreeing to buy a 40% stake from current owner Peter Angelos before acquiring the remaining stake when he dies. The 94-year-old bought the team for $173 million, Lisa, back in 1993. Well, David Rubenstein is from Baltimore. And next time we have Bond, we'll have we to talk about, about, about this for a while, this. about whether he'd be interested in doing it. And he is. And he's. this isn't his first investment in a sports team. We know that. But it's also, there have been a series of them, which I think is kind of interesting. And I wonder how much this is about profitability and how much it's about nostalgia. It's kind of like the Steve Cohen right, you know, okay. investment in the Mets. And that was something driven from you know a certain passion. If I had the money, I'd do the same thing. You would? Oh, yeah. I'd buy AC Milan. Without a doubt, I'd love to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd love to do that. Even though Italian football is not what it once was in the in the 90s, I'd still buy AC Milan. Your first change? My first change? Yeah. This, you said it's an I'd bring Paolo Maldini back okay. to help me run the club. That would be my first change. <laughs> All right. Number Duly one decision noted. on day one. That is exactly what I would do. Let's talk about treasuries, less about football. The treasury refunding announcement just crossed in moments ago. Mike McKee has the details. Hey, Mike. John, we also have the uh, employment cost index. And between Treasury refunding and employment cost index, while you guys have been chatting, we've had a big market move. So something in there is really affecting the Treasury markets. Uh, the employment cost index comes in up nine-tenths of a percent, and wages and salaries up nine-tenths of a percent. Strong gains, so that may have had an impact. Now, in terms of Treasury refunding, basically it comes in as uh, calculated, expected by a lot of people in the Treasury market after the borrowing needs uh, number came out on Monday. $121 billion offered, refunding $105.1 billion in maturing bills and uh, raising $15.9 billion in maturing cash. Uh, Three-year note. Uh, auction next week, 54 billion, 10 year note, 42 billion, 30 year bond, 25 billion. Uh, you note that they are all uh, increased as Treasury promised at the last refunding. Uh, they're raising the size at this particular auction and they're going to be raising the uh, quarterly uh, size of auctions for most of the uh, tenors except for the 20 year going forward. Uh, Treasury uh, by the end of the quarter up nine billion, uh, three uh, the two year rather the ten year up two billion, and in terms of other news there, um, this is the last quarter of increases to coupon auction sizes. They say they're going to maintain bill sizes at about the same level into late March. By late March or early April, they will start reducing the size of bill auctions. Of course, April is when tax payments come in, and they're going to start doing some small value test buybacks in April. They said that they uh, are going to start doing uh, the uh, off-the-run buybacks, but not yet. They'll do some tests and then uh, announce the first regular buyback schedule when we get to the May refunding numbers. So uh, it looks like at this point, um, strong economy and uh, Treasury still has some debt issues to deal with. But one interesting note, I'll, I'll throw this out there because I know Ira's coming on. The Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee, which gives the uh, Treasury Department advice on what it should be doing, notes that market concerns around large deficits, which were partially responsible for driving yields higher, appear to have waned. So less concern about deficits in the markets than there had been. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Initially, there was a reaction. It's faded since. We're down about two basis points on a 10-year if you're looking at the two-year yield, we're down about three basis points, three, four basis points lower to 4.29.94. I'm not really sure what that excitement was about in the last five minutes or so, Lisa, in the bond market. I would suspect it has something to do with the employment cost index more than the Treasury refunding announcement because the Treasury refunding announcement pretty much in line with uh, where they were in November and basically where we were guided to earlier this week. The employment cost index coming in lower, though, materially lower than people expected, just sort of speaks to this fact that we're, even though we have strength in the economy, Economy, disinflation continues to the degree that can give the Fed some comfort to cut rates. Do you think we're overemphasizing materially lower on the ECI? 
No, are, you, do you, are you suggesting that I am? No, no, just, 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 <laughs> no, I'm just it, kidding. Zero point nine percent versus the expectation of one percent. Well, I mean, price. honestly, it's a subtle downside surprise, but it's down from one point one percent the prior okay. quarter. So that's that's a material These things shift. matter. I'm just yeah, I'm yeah. asking the question. That's oh yeah, all. just theoretically. I'm not trying to argue. There. Just exactly. <laughs> on the mm. equity market at the moment, on the S&P 500, <laughs> down about zero point five. On the Nasdaq, we're down about one four percentage point. Ira Jersey with us from Bloomberg Intelligence, chief U.S. interest rate strategist. Ira, your thoughts on what we just heard in the last 10 minutes or so? Yeah, so I have not looked at the employment cost index. I've been focused, uh, you know, very keenly on the quarterly refunding announcement, which did have in in the details a few little surprises. So what what it particularly for me, and and that was that the the Treasury Department is going to be increasing two year notes and five year note offerings, uh, which will happen at the end of February, um, more than than certainly we had expected. So they're actually uh, increasing two year uh, notes three billion dollars a month for the next three months. So that's another nine billion dollars of two year notes. Notes, uh, that we're going to get up to $69 billion every auction, which um, I, I'm pretty sure is a record. Uh, if memory serves, 67 was the old uh, what was the old record. Um, so, so even though deficits are are certainly moderating slightly compared to what they were in the second half of last year, um, and becoming much more seasonal and normal, um, th there's still going to be this net issuance uh, that that the government has to do. Um, the other big thing was the announcement that they are going to be starting buybacks in the uh, in the next quarter, it, it sounds like. And, and if they do that, then they'll, they'll probably have to increase uh, the on the run coupon auction just a little bit more um, and uh, in order to conduct those those programs. But but keep in mind that that might actually help market liquidity a little bit, which hasn't been particularly good of late, John. What's the significance, Ira, of increasing the two-year and the five-year uh, maturities in terms of just what the market is prepared to absorb? I'm not seeing that much reaction in markets, and if anything, yields were lower on those maturities after this announcement came out. Yeah, I, I'm not sure why everyone decided to go buy two-year yields, uh, two-year notes when when they're going to be a lot more supply. Um, that, that didn't quite make sense to me, and I think that that'll get worked out over time, particularly when we see the auctions themselves. So, so I think there's two things. I think one is the there's an acknowledgement by the uh, Treasury Department that they've been issuing a whole lot of T-bills, and they don't want to have to issue quite as many as they have during past quarters. Um, so, so by increasing that short end of the curve, so twos, threes, and five-year notes, uh, that will allow them to issue less T-bills. We had ex been expecting about $400 billion of T-bills to be issued this quarter on net. Uh, they guided to 300 to 350 billion, so you're talking about you know 50 billion dollars less in T bills than uh, than we had anticipated. So uh, uh, so I think that that's the discussion. Basically, they're starting to term out the debt a little bit here, and I think as interest rates come down further, the, uh, the Treasury Department will look to term out the debt even more and increase the average weighted maturity of all of the Treasury's outstanding because that's that's shortened quite a lot as they've issued a couple of trillion dollars of T bills over the past couple of years. Ira, I'd love to stepping back your view on what the Treasury Secretary has done with respect to some of these borrowings in terms of actually surprising to the downside how much we're going to be borrowing in the first uh, quarter and then pushing that out in, a, in potentially medium sized duration. All of these sort of machinations to try to keep some sort of common markets. Do you think that it seems uh, like it's savvy or do you think that it will sort of be the bill that hits later in the year when we have to increase issuance that much more? Well, I think there's a couple of things. One, keep in mind that that the treasury, the amount that the Treasury Department raises, has to do with what it thinks the deficit's going to be for that quarter. So that has not, that's not a choice that Janet Yellen or anyone at the Treasury Department makes. That's actually a, a choice that Congress makes, and it just happens to be that they're going to be uh, about 56 billion dollars less of the deficit this quarter than they had projected three months ago. By the way, I thought that there would be a lower deficit um, than 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 there was. So it you know definitely surprised the consensus, but it. Did didn't surprise everyone that there's going to be slightly lower deficit. The the other thing is, and I think that there's there's some people in the market think that the Treasury Department is doing something unusual and issuing all of these T bills. Uh, if you go back to the 1980s through now, the Treasury Department almost always uh, increases the amount of T bills in, as a share of their portfolio when interest rates are high, and then when interest rates are low, it turns out that debt. Um, you know, you could argue that maybe they should have, you know, done a lot more 10-year and 30-year debt when interest rates were near zero. Sure, you can definitely say that, but at the same time, this is a, a very typical, um, a very typical cycle that that the Treasury Department does. The difference now between 
happening now and say those prior cycles is that you normally don't have growth as strong as it is with deficits as high as they are, right? Normally deficits are low when growth is as strong as we've seen it the last couple of years. And I think that that's, that's a major difference between this cycle and others is that you you know you don't expect 760 billion dollars of net borrowing when nominal gdp is running at five percent right that just is not a a normal environment and and i think that that's a bit of a challenge for for treasury and trying to manage how much it's issuing of different debt and keeping the cost to the taxpayer in terms of interest rates low because that's hard to do when you know interest rates are at five percent for uh, for short-term debt and and four percent for longer-term debt all right we appreciate the modesty it's going to catch up. Ara Jersey there. <laughs> it was a surprise to you, but it wasn't to uh, some Well, uh, I mean, I understand all these small little victories. You're like, I got it right. Why didn't everyone listen I to I like me? how you're calling it a small little victory. As no, well. it's not a small of little victory. Not. It's, 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 yeah, it's, in, sure. it's understanding okay. Ira hung mechanics, up. honestly. <laughs> Ira, thank you for your contribution. Thank you, Ira. We appreciate your contribution, sir. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Yahara Hackers. Hey, Yahara. Hi, John. House Republicans are moving toward impeaching Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. A GOP panel approved two articles of impeachment, sending the vote to the House floor. However, the effort is likely to die in the Senate. Mayorkas is in the hot seat as security at the U.S. border with Mexico remains a hot button issue. Activist investor Nelson Peltz has a plan to fix Disney's profitability in streaming, and it involves bundles. Peltz's fir Peltz firm, Try and Fund Management, will recommend the company seek to bundle its ESPN Plus service with a larger player interested in sports, such as Netflix. Try and controls close to $3 billion in Disney shares and is seeking two seats on Disney's board. Lamborghini has sold out of its supercars until 2026. It's an indication the world's wealthiest consumers are showing few signs of being affected by a broader global slowdown. The Italian luxury car brand posted record sales of more than 10,000 vehicles last year, driven in part by the introduction of its first plug-in hybrid model. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahara, thank you. Up next on this program, looking ahead to a Fed rate decision. What the Fed's going to do today is open a door, but basically tell us it hasn't decided when it's going to walk through it. And I think there's a story here about inflation coming down that's encouraging them. That's coming up next on the program, live from New York City. You're watching Bloomberg TV. From New York, counting it down to the opening bell, 42 minutes away from the cash open. Equity futures on the S&P 500, negative here by almost 0.5%. Under surveillance this morning, looking ahead to a Fed rate decision. What the Fed's going to do today is open a door, but basically tell us it hasn't decided when it's going to walk through it. And I think there's a story here about inflation coming down that's encouraging them. But there's also a story about the economy looking pretty strong here, which is raising questions about how restrictive actually the 5.5% policy stance is. The Federal Reserve expected to hold rates steady, but the timing of cuts remain in question. Senate Banking Chairman Sherrod Brown saying this, while more must be done to address the fact that costs remain too high, it is becoming increasingly evident that restrictive monetary policy is no longer the right tool for combating inflation. Claudia Sam. Former Federal Reserve economist and founder of Saab Consulting, a good friend of this program, joins us now. Claudia, wonderful to catch up with you. We have to tackle the politics first, if you don't mind. How unhelpful is it to hear from senators weighing in on Fed policy ahead of the Federal Reserve, which is gearing up to cut interest rates anyway? It's not a good thing. I mean, everybody can express their views, and we've certainly heard it on both sides of the aisle. Everybody's got an opinion about what the Fed should do. I do also. Uh, <laughs> and the Fed is going to have to try really hard just to not listen at all. But the Fed is political. It's in D.C., not partisan, but they are in the crossfire, and they always are. In an election year, this is not helpful, given the big decisions they have. But this is just this is where we are. You think they should go sooner rather than later. Do you think the calendar influences that in any way, shape or form, just in terms of the election being in November? If you need to go, let's get moving. Not so much with the timing. And, and honestly, the biggest factor this year is the Fed. I mean, they just they drag their feet and it's clear that that's where they're headed. So 
it's the, more about the calendar is whenever you start cutting, that is going to have some constraint on how much you can cut for the year. And the politics are already going in full force. So there's nothing about the calendar that's going to help them on that. So let's talk about your opinion of the Fed, because you said that you have one, and I'd love to get it. Neil Dutta has an opinion of Renaissance Macro, and after we got the ECI data and some others, mm -hmm. he put out with all caps, doves have all they need. The Fed cannot rule out March, March, nor should they. Do you think that there has been a green light in the recent economic data for the Fed to start cutting in March? I don't think it matters. They should be cutting this afternoon. Frankly, the case is there. Inflation is coming down. We're headed to dual mandate. Nobody's asking for 200 basis points this afternoon, right? 25 basis points get moving. And yet I see May as the absolute earliest that the Federal Reserve is going to cut. They just like it's not Fed like to get going. They, they are always behind the curve and they're going to do it here now. It may not matter much. I worry a lot about in credit markets because I think that's where it would matter first than being slow. And yet, I mean, come on, it's the Fed. But they have the case. Neil is absolutely right. The case is there. What's the argument uh, to really start cutting sooner? If you have credit markets that are wide open, you have financial conditions that have gotten really quite easy. You have people where you get uh, economic confidence picking back up. MasterCard just came out a bit ago. People still spending. What's the argument for the Fed to make a move? The dual mandate. I mean, by the time they get to 2% inflation, and it's kind of hanging at 2%, they should be out of the way. Now, we can argue about what that restrictive, not restrictive interest rate is, so the infamous R star, but there's no way that we're not above it. I mean, the Fed says that too. If they don't get going with the, the cutting and we see the inflation rate really coming down, they're, they're going to miss it. Like, they're not going to be out of the way when we get to 2%, and that's a big problem for them. And Jay Powell said at the last meeting, and this was so important, that the Fed does not think to get inflation down, they have to have slow growth. And that was a big change for them. So I should be on the prize here, 2% inflation. That final point is such a good point. Can we just talk about the other side of the dual mandate and talk about what's happening in employment? In the labor market, Claudia, when you look at the surface level stuff, things still look okay. South of 4% unemployment, mm -hmm. jobless claims in at around 200K. You're far better than this at me, than me, far better than most, actually, when it comes to the labour market. Claudia, what do you see right now? Do you see signs of weakness emerging? There are signs. When you look under the hood, there are places where they're showing some weakness. Now, I still look at the labour market and say, this is good, and it has a lot of strength and is still in a resilient place. We are in this place where it really looks like we've rebalanced, like things have gotten, you know, the job pays, it's it's slower, absolutely, than a year or so ago. And yet it's, it looks like before the pandemic, quits rates, a lot of pieces look like before the pandemic, which when we had a good economy. But be, as things are slowing, it could be rebalancing. That's what I see. But it could also be this slow grind down. And once it gets going south, it's really hard to stop it. So yeah, there's signs and we're going to see more on Friday as to how much these are really flashing yellow well, or not. Just to put a bow on that, Claudia, you did coin the SOM rule and I know you've pushed back. It's, you know, in terms of just how it's applied. How close are we to triggering that kind of un increase in unemployment, just the pace of the increase? How much are you looking for this Friday? So we're nowhere near triggering the SOM rule. The unemployment rate smoothed out is up two tenths of a percentage point relative to a trigger of five tenths of a percentage point. Like if we manage that trigger on Friday, I will have passed out dead or something. Like there's just no way we have those kind of moves in. And I'm not kidding. Uh, you know, so I think the consensus is we see a little bit of a drift up in the unemployment rate to 3.8 percent. But I mean, come on, we have the longest stretch now below 4 percent unemployment since the 1960s. This is really good. Pretty amazing. Claudia, you're one of our favourites. It's great to hear from you on Fed Decision Day. Thanks for being with us. Former Federal Reserve Thank economist you. Claudia Sam there. You mentioned Neil Dutta. Neil wrote in just on the Bloomberg moments ago, the Dove should be fighting tooth and nail. It's over. <laughs> well, he's it's trying. It's over. I think Claudia would agree with that as well. Yeah, he, she basically said they should cut this afternoon. I love Neil. They just all caps, you know, doves have all they need. Go. Here's the question. What's the risk of not going now? Is there a material risk of that downturn? We have heard that from absolutely 
very few people. I mean, some people have, I guess, Dom Cosmo. I was going to say no one, but I can, I can point to a couple of people who are worried about the downside. But otherwise, we're not seeing signs of that, which is a reason why people say it's not necessarily as balanced to sort of go them into rushing to cut rates. If you wanted a good roundtable right now, I think Claudia Sam, Neil Dutcher on the one side, Sebastian Page, Wei Lee, both of them from earlier in the program, they don't think it's over. They think there's a window here where it feels good, but ultimately it's not over. That we're going to that glide path of 3% inflation. Even if we hit the 2% target, then it's going to creep up higher. This, to me, is going to be the conversation later this year. I think a lot of people in the markets are thinking, OK, well, we don't have to worry about that then because now we can just carry on with the momentum that we've got. I need about a minute just to go through the promo for the Fed show a little bit later. The lineup <laughs> is absolutely stacked. So 1.30 Eastern time, our coverage begins. Special surveillance special of the Fed Decides. We'll be joined by JP Morgan's Priya Misra, Matt Lazzetti at Deutsche Bank, former Fed Vice Chair Richard Clara, Diane Swank at KPMG. We'll break down the decision at 2 p.m. Robert Tipp of PGM, Michael Gapen of Bank of America, former New York Fed President Bill Dudley, Jeff Rosenberg of BlackRock, and a man called TK. Yeah. <laughs> All of that and a whole lot more coming up a little bit later this afternoon.